and welcome to the October 4th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton Number City nine. Council. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. Um, we begin each meeting with a public comment session and uh, we have a sign up sheet of folks who wish to speak in the public comment session. And I want to just Thank point you. out behind me, there's a three minute timer to keep the time. I'd ask folks to please, when they come to the podium, to state their name and address for the record and, and please adhere to the three minute time limit so that everyone has an equal opportunity to share their comments. The first person signed up this evening is Alicia Ralph. Hi, I'm Alicia Ralph. I live at 755 West Hampton Road. And I'm here tonight to talk about some more of the great work that the Northampton Reuse Committee is doing. Uh, last week, we collected medical equipment and on October 13th, we'll be doing a, an even bigger uh, event with a lot more stuff to collect. So uh, it's important to me that you all start saving your styrofoam because this is the second time you are able to actually recycle that odious material. <coughs> uh, so save your styrofoam, bring it nice and clean to JFK from 9 to noon. Also bring me anything with a plug because you can recycle your electronic stuff, your little appliances, um, and JFK will get a little bit of that recycling money, the money that you would put towards uh, fixing that. And for the first time ever, it's free to recycle media. So if you have VHS tapes or DVDs or CDs that you don't want anymore, they'll collect those and it'll be free. So don't throw it in the landfill. Try not to do that. And the most fun part of this uh, reuse day on October 13th is the Rally for the Arts. And there will be almost 30 artists who use repurposed materials in their artwork that will be on display and for sale. And many of them will be offering workshops on how to create things like uh, shoes and uh, fabulous jewelry. They do these cool things with recycled materials. And what I think is a lot of fun is there'll be a costume making workshop because that's just before Halloween. So we're also encouraging people to, uh, if they have uh, clothes that are haunting their closets, like bridesmaids dresses, for example. If you bring that for the <laughs> Halloween costume exchange, which will also be taking place, uh, that will be fun. So as you know, I like to bring props. So if you happen to go to, say, the Apple Spree at Look Park last week, you might have a hat as fine as this that you could bring to the costume exchange. So I uh, hope to see you all there. And remember to reuse. Don't feed the landfill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. The next speaker is Jeff Napolitano. Hi, I'm Jeff Napolitano, uh, 266 Grove Street. Uh, I work at the American Friends Service Committee, and we are one of the organizations that is um, having an event on October 15th. Um, Congressman Jim McGovern, uh, Joe Comerford, who r runs the National Priorities Project, uh, and Representatives Peter Cocott and Ellen Story are coming to speak in favor of um, the uh, Budget for All uh, ballot initiative that's going to be on the ballot. Uh, it's a referendum question. It's going to be on the ballot in Northampton, Amherst, Holyoke, um, and a dozen towns in the Berkshires, um, and a lot of towns in eastern Massachusetts. Um, this is a nonpartisan event that is open to everybody. Um, it is free to the public. Uh, and they're going to be discussing this uh, ballot initiative that basically calls for or asks voters whether they're in favor of um, these four, four issues. And one is preventing cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and veteran benefits, uh, creating and projecting, uh, protecting jobs by investing in manufacturing, schools, housing, renewable energy. Um, providing new revenues um, by reducing the federal de deficit by closing corporate tax loopholes, uh, and finally by redirecting military spending to domestic needs by reducing um, the military budget through ending the war in Afghanistan and bringing uh, U.S. troops home. Um, so this is sort of my invitation to everybody uh, to come Octo Monday, October 15th, 7 o'clock uh, in the uh, Northampton High School Auditorium, um, and remember to vote yes on the referendum question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff. The next uh, person who signed up this evening is Kathleen Silva. Good evening. Kathleen Silva, Riverside Drive in Florence, Mass. Since Mayor Narkowitz has taken over as mayor of Northampton, some things have come into light, such as 
the total mismanagement of the parking garage, questionable undocumented time owed to the senior center director, and unaccounted for but previously purchased tools and equipment from the DPW. So that's why when I learned that some counselors were on the city's health care expense, I began to ask questions. What I found after numerous emails from the human resource director was that there are six city councilors on the city's health care expense. Three are on the family plan and three are on the singles plan, costing the taxpayers of Northampton a total of $54,129 per year. If you take an average household property tax of $3,500 a year, it takes approximately 15 household property taxes every year to cover that expense. This example is exactly what President Obama speaks about. The rich not paying their fair share, but getting benefits off the backs of the middle class taxpayers. These six city councilors who help, whose health care is being funded by the taxpayers of Northampton are some of the wealthiest residents in this city. In my opinion, you should all be ashamed of yourselves for taking advantage of the Northampton residents. Thank you. The next speaker is Mike Kirby. Yep. Former Councillor Mike Kirby. Yes, indeed. And nobody told me about the benefit. <laughs> um, I'd like to speak briefly about the benefit, Kathy said. I was on the phone this morning to uh, Michael Bardsley about another matter, and I asked him, uh, did you take the insurance uh, benefit? And he said, what insurance benefit? And I had to explain it to him, how much money was involved, what the thing, and he had no recollection of this being told about this benefit at all. Now, he said, I might have received something in writing, but I don't think so. So when I was on the council, no one told me about it. And it seems to be a matter of something that's passed from so-and-so tells so-and-so, and some people get it, some people don't. Now, I was talking about it with the person in my family who has more brains than I do, my wife. And, and she and I were talking about it. And I said, why is only two people, or one or two people on the school committee take it, and whereas the, the, the big majority of the city council takes this benefit? And her theory was that the school committee has their noses right in the trouble that we're in as a city every year in terms of layoffs of teachers, in terms of possible um, class size, and a lot of other things, that they're in touch more. And maybe they're reluctant. This might not be true. OK. My, I want to take one minute to talk about McDonald House and what's going on down there. And I have passed to you a leaflet that was passed underneath everybody's doors following the last committee meeting of the last meeting of the city of the uh, of the of the housing authority. It was a very stormy meeting, and people up there are upset. Not everybody, but it's very tense these days. And I think that John Hyde has lost control of that building in many respects. Um, and the city ought to take responsibility for the house, a more aggressive role in terms of managing the housing authority because the mayor appoints quite a few members on the board. And we have a responsibility to have these buildings be safe places for people. Right now, we have a church, a small sect, doing business in the, in the day room at McDonald House every week. That's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. OK, 
Okay, that's the end of the sign-up list. Is there anyone else who didn't sign up who wishes to speak during the public comment period? Okay, hearing none, I'll close the public comment and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll for the regular meeting. Here. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Here. Councilor Barge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Present. Councilor Stafford. Here. Councilor Schwartz. Here. Councilor Tacey. Here. Excellent. Um, I wanted to, uh, you have before you your September 20th, 2012 minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Vote to approve them. Second. Second. Okay. Hearing none. Uh, any discussion or objections? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We have a um, proclamation uh, that I'd like to present. Um, this is in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, October 2012. Whereas freedom from violence is the foundation of a safe, healthy, and prosperous community, and whereas domestic violence affects all citizens of Northampton, Hampshire County, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and crosses all social, racial, religious, ethnic, geographic, educational, and economic backgrounds, and whereas during 2011 there were 24 incidents of intimate partner homicide during which a total of 29 people died, including 18 or, or current or former partners and two children, and already in 2012 there have been two alleged domestic violence homicides in Hampshire County. And whereas in 2008 Governor Deval Patrick declared domestic violence to be a health emergency recognizing that it costs the nation billions annually in medical expenses, police, court costs, shelters, foster care, sick leave, absenteeism, and non-productivity. And whereas safe passage serves Hampshire County in comprehensive response to domestic violence, including an emergency shelter, advocacy and prevention, and promotes a coordinated community effort in order to stop this horrendous crime, and whereas Safe Passage will mobilize the community by coordinating a local Brides March on October 12th as a public awareness and activism forum in commemoration of Gladys Rickert. In 2001, she was murdered by her abusive former boyfriend hours before her wedding to her fiance. Women who march wear wedding dresses or dress in white. Men wear all black or a black armband. And whereas city government observes Domestic Violence Month and the Brides March as excellent opportunities for the citizens of Northampton and the surrounding communities to be active in awareness and prevention of domestic violence, now, therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and October 12th as Brides March Day. I urge everyone to work together to eliminate domestic violence. Let us remember the victims, celebrate the survivors, and participate to make our community safe for all its citizens. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal this fourth day of October, 2012. And I believe we have a representative from Safe Passage here uh, to accept it. Um, um, why don't I give it to you, and then if you just want to say a few quick words. No. suspend that rule it's a late file thank you very much mayor and members of city council my name is Marianne Winters and I'm the executive director of safe passage um, I'm very proud of our organization I've been there about 15 months and have um, witnessed firsthand the amazing work that most people don't realize happens inside our doors um, the work of healing the work of transformation the work of rebuilding people's lives when they've left a domestic violence um, relationship very often um, people come to Northampton, they're welcomed by our community. Our shelter is in one of the neighborhoods of Northampton, and we try very hard to be, be good neighbors, and the neighbors around us really <coughs> welcome many of the residents who have resettled. Um, in fact, some of the stores and restaurants that you may eat at actually are owned and started and managed by formerly battered women. And you, know, you may never know the exact, you know the exact numbers or the exact people, but Northampton, Hampshire County is a a welcoming and open place to um, victims of domestic violence and their children and also to the transformation that needs to take place in order to have a violence-free society. So 
the Brides March, which we're sponsoring, is a, um, it's a pretty riveting event. It commemorates, it remembers a woman named Gladys Ricart, who was a Latino immigrant in, in New Jersey. Um, she was in an abusive relationship. She got help. She left that relationship. She thought it was over. She met someone new. And on the day that she was to marry him, her former boyfriend, um, murdered her in front of her friends and family. They were get, they were preparing for the wedding itself. So um, it struck a chord among her friends, among cultures, among communities, because of the the nature and the motivation of the assault was just as simple as you know the old adage, "If I can't have you, no one will," and that was all there was to it. So because that's all there was to it. We, we, along with domestic violence organizations around the country and around the world, believe that it can be stopped. And so we want to do our part locally. We're thinking globally. We're part of an international movement that's really um, changing the way um, communities and governments are responding. We offer any help and assistance to this council, to the city, um, in terms of um, assisting with Northampton becoming a, a violence-free and um, supportive place for um, survivors of domestic violence. So I thank you for this proclamation and hope to see many of you next Friday. What time? Thank you. What it's, time? Um, it begins at 3 o'clock in front of our office building at 43 Center Street. I have some flyers that I'll pass around as, uh, you know, as we're leaving. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we just have one more proclamation, um, and this is actually a late file. Uh, and this is so I would spend a roll. Thank you. Spend roll from me. Okay. It's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, this is a, a, another a proclamation. Uh, this is entitled Polish Heritage Month, October 2012. Whereas since 1608, when the first Polish settlers arrived at Jamestown, Virginia, Polish people have been an important <coughs> part of America's history and culture. And whereas Polish people have distinguished themselves and their heritage by making major contribution to the arts, the sciences, education, our democratic ideals and principles, and to humanity, and whereas our country and our democratic system have been protected by many brave and caring individuals of Polish heritage who have helped to keep us free, and whereas in October 1929, Northampton Mayor Jesse Andre accepted from the Northampton Polish American Societies the General Kazimierz Pulaski Monument, Monument to honor his service in the American Revolution, and whereas this month we mark the 233rd anniversary of the death of General Kazimierz Pulaski, who saved General George Washington's life at the Battle of Brandywine in 1777, and who then was appointed commander of the Continental Cavalry by General Washington. And whereas it is important for all people to appreciate and recognize the contribution of all heritages to our society, now therefore I, Mayor David Narkowitz, recognizing the contribution of Polish people everywhere, especially in our city, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2012 to be Polish Heritage Month in the city of Northampton. Let us all celebrate the contributions that people of Polish descent have made to our nation and particularly to our city in the arts, the sciences, agriculture, religion, and scholarship. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the city of Northampton uh, this fourth day of October, 2012. We don't have someone from the, um, from the organization to accept it tonight, but I just did want to remind folks that this Monday on Columbus Day, which is October 8th, um, we will be having the annual uh, Pulaski Day Parade and commemoration, uh, which begins 11 a.m. at Holly Street, marches to Pulaski Park, which is then followed by uh, the annual uh, celebration and commemoration of General Pulaski. So I'll make sure that this gets to that organization. Mr. Mayor, wh where does the parade begin? It begins on Holly Street. Um, next to the uh, former St. Uh, John parking John. lot near St. John Cantius Church. Right. That's where it is. It's on King Street. Yeah, it's starting King Street now. Interesting. Is it we Valentine's? It's across from our business. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the Valentine's Church. I'm sorry. Yeah. They have moved it to the, since St. John Cantius has now moved to, it's now starts yes. at King Street. Thank you. Yes. St. Valentine's. Thank you for Church. catching that. You're welcome. Right. Okay, so now um, we've completed the pro uh, proclamations, resolutions, awards, and recognitions. Are there any one-minute announcements before we move on to the next item? 
Councilor. Uh, I have been asked to apprise citizens of an event called Pause for Princess, uh, and I'll read you. Uh, we are a local grassroots group uh, who support the safety of all feral, lost, and abandoned cats, and the focus of this group is to bring attention, uh, to bring together compassionate, caring individuals who are looking for information or education on how to care for feral cats, trap and neuter programs, resources, emergency situations, DIY winter shelters, and networking. Please stop by our table at clock uh, Clarktoberfest at the Clark School for Hearing and Speech. To bring a photo and a brief description or an anecdote, of, uh, an anecdote, I think is what they're saying, of your cats uh, to put up on either our wall of remembrance or a special monuments wall. Uh, so that's Saturday, October 13th at the Clark School campus on 40, uh, 47 Round Hill Road, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thank you. Councilor Schwartz. Uh, I just wanted to make an announcement around the South Street traffic calming project coming to the next stage, which is to say road work will begin on Tuesday, October 9th, and will probably last for about two weeks. And it's um, it's an exciting launch um, of making the street narrower, thereby safer, and safer for cars and bikers alike. So just be advised. There will be some construction uh, happening and uh, it'll be down to one lane for a couple of weeks. So I ask for everyone's patience in the name of a great outcome for everybody. Thank you. Councilor Tacey. And on, to piggyback on that, it will also happen on Leonard Street uh, in Leeds and um, Front Street at the, at the same contract. And also a groundbreaking happened for the Florence Recreation Fields fine time was had by all it was uh, just great Councilor Freeman Day. October 14th Sunday 2 to 4 is the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association annual meeting everyone from Ward 3 is invited there'll be music and uh, refreshments and all the councilors are invited as well it's at the three county fairgrounds at uh, Sunday October 14th 2 o'clock Councilor Schwartz we've got a Full day, a lot of choices, a lot to pack in on the 14th. It's also Shelter Sunday, um, which is an opportunity to go door to door in your neighborhood or another's neighborhood and and uh, raise funds for our area shelters and food pantries. Uh, contact ServiceNet, you'll see signs around town, but you can find ServiceNet's number and um, call to sign up. It's also Grow Food Northampton's Harvest Celebration. Um, that's 11.30 to four, I believe, out at, um, at the farm um, in Florence, and uh, it should be a really fun and celebratory event. So, a lot to do on Sunday, the 14th. Okay. Uh, Councillor Labarge and then Councillor Tacey. Um, I just would like to announce, and it's a reminder for all residents living on Caroline Terrace, Drusen Drive, and O'Donnell Drive, there will be a neighborhood meeting and the um, director of the Board of Health will be attending it, um, the, um, one of the Northampton police officers, and also Joan Serafin will be attending that. So it's a reminder for all of those three streets to remember that it starts at 5 o'clock. It will be at Donna Burns' house from 5 to about 8 o'clock at night, and she lives at 69 Caroline Terrace. Councilor. Just for a quick note for the Finance Committee, the seven gold shovels that were used at the groundbreaking were not real gold, they were Krylon. Just letting you know. Okay. Uh, that concludes, I believe, the announcements. Um, so we'll now move into appointments, elections, and public hearings. Um, and it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our police chief, uh, Russell Sinkowitz, who will be um, doing some swearing in as well as departmental awards. Chief. Good evening, all. I know you have a busy agenda, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, but the reality is these are important things, the awards that we give out. Uh, these are awards from the year 2011. Uh, we tried to get it scheduled in the summer to come in to see, uh, visit all of you. That just didn't happen. And as luck would have it, we've had some promotions and some uh, new uh, uh, police officer appointments. So we're consolidating everything in one meeting. So please bear with me. Uh, one of the first things I want to do is to mention our promotions. We'll get to the award shortly. I'd like to call a promotion to a lieutenant, John Cartilage. Would you please come forward? Wendy, you're all set? Great. <laughs> it all comes together eventually. John Cartilage, 
It's a Northampton native is a 17-year veteran who was selected from a strong field of candidates for the rank of lieutenant. He will be signed as the shift commander for the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Hired in 1995, John was a patrol officer who worked all three different shifts. In 2003, he was selected and certified to be a field training officer for the department. In 2007, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant, assigned as a line supervisor to the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. There he was also the primary field training and evaluation program supervisor. As you all recall, that's one of our, once you get through the academy or if you're a hire that comes from another department or uh, a self-sponsored academy, that's a 16-week program that they are all made to go through. Uh, it really does screen out the, the best of the best, the uh, best police officers that serve your community. He was also the department's accreditation manager since 2008. And again, we are on our fourth reaccreditation. John did a phenomenal amount of work uh, to accomplish that task. He, he took it to heart. He took it every day, came in early, stayed late, did great work. Um, these are both positions because he did such a good job as lieutenant. He gets to keep doing it. <laughs> John was also responsible for the upkeep of the department's video recording systems. These are the dash cam cameras on the uh, cruisers, all the line cruisers. He acted as the department's community services liaison, assisted in the organiza organization and oversight of the department's Citizens Police Academy along with uh, Lieutenant Casper, and has both organized and supervised the department's role in security and traffic control for the city's first night activities for the past several years, which you're aware is very complicated. It's you know, 10,000 people in the middle of downtown on New Year's Eve. John's done an excellent job in putting that whole plan together, or af after action plans, and then uh, reevaluating how we can improve it through the next year. Uh, interestingly, as I said, he worked for Look Park. Also, interestingly, tonight, you'll see a couple of West Hartford police officers here. Chief T uh, Tracy Goff is a friend of John's. He's a Hatfield native, he was a Look Park Ranger, just like John was at the same time. And he has been elevated to the chief of the West Hartford Police Department. So uh, I welcome him for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks, Your driver. Thanks, <laughs> I don't get a driver. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're not. So, <laughs> Madam Clerk, yes. John, would you please step forward and be sworn in? And I should have said this is a family-friendly event. Um, should have brought the family up. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Chief. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats. If you'd like to take a picture with the mayor, please. That would be a picture of the mayor. Would be fine with that? Driver photographer. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Chief. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. It's fine. <laughs> Tomorrow, check hashtag Jake Carlidge on Twitter and you'll see these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I'd like to call up Joseph Tarsh. And again, if family wants to get up for a picture, this is the perfect time to do that. Joseph's a seven-year veteran who's also selected from a field of strong candidates for the rank of sergeant. He too, when he gets promoted, will be assigned to the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift as one of that shift's line supervisors. 
Joseph was hired in 2005. Joe has worked his entire career on a 3 to 11 shift. In 2009, Joe was selected and then certified to be a tra traffic accident reconstructionist. And in 2010, he was selected and certified as a field training officer for the department. Prior to employment here, Joe worked security at Smith & Wesson, as well as being employed at the Hamden County Sheriff's Department. He holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Ennicott College. And Joe, uh, just like John, has been recognized and commended for exemplary work by both citizens and uh, departmental supervisors. So, Madam Clerk, if I may ask you again. Solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To faithfully and impartially. To faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of sergeant. Discharge the duties of sergeant. In the Northampton Police Department. In, Northampton Police Department. in accordance with the rules and laws of the police department. In accordance with the rules and laws of the police department. The Constitution of this Commonwealth. The Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the ordinances of the City of Northampton. The ordinances of the City of Northampton. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Four new hires coming to you tonight. We could ask Christo Christopher Dumas, Brennan McKinney, Andrew McGrath, and Jeffrey Staples to please step forward. Christopher Dumas, originally from Grafton, also graduated from the Boylston Police Academy as a self sponsored recruit through the Westboro Police Department in December of 2011. Uh, if you understand, we, when we got out of civil service, we were able to recruit and hire people from different departments and also uh, self-sponsored people out of different police academies. Uh, Christopher is one of those. He success successfully completed our department's 15-week field training and evaluation program and is now currently assigned as a patrol officer in the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Christopher is an honorably discharged veteran of the United States Army and is, is still an active reservist. He holds an associate's degree from Quinsigamond Community College. And you'll also recall once out of civil service, we get into our private testing. Our entry level candidates are all associate's degrees minimum or equivalent <coughs> experience if you're a military veteran. Uh, we're going to swear all four of them in together, Madam Clerk, if that's okay with you. Brendan McKinney of East Hampton graduated from the Western Mass Regional Police Academy in Springfield in June of this year. Brendan was also the recipient of his Academy Classes Academic Achievement Award presented to the officer who has the highest academic average. Prior to being hired here, Brennan was a part-time officer for the Southampton Police Department. He holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He also just completed the FTE program this past week, and he too will be assigned to the 11 to 7 shift. So, Brendan, raise your hand so they know who you are. <laughs> Chris, raise your hand so they know. <laughs> Trying to put faces with names here, that's the purpose of this. Andrew McGrath. Hey, okay, there you go. I know Andrew. Andrew was originally from Melrose, graduated from the Western Mass Regional Police Academy in Springfield in June of this year. Prior to being hired here, Andrew worked as a victim witness advocate for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. He holds a bachelor's degree in legal studies from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He, too, successfully completed the department's field training and evaluation program this past week. And he, too, was assigned to the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And lastly, Jeffrey. End of the line. Okay, Jeffrey. Jeffrey is from Belchertown. He graduated from the Western Mass Regional Police Academy in Springfield in June of this year. Prior to being hired here, Jeff was employed as a manager for Spoke Enterprises in Amherst. He holds a bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I was going to say the animals in Amherst. <laughs> <laughs> Amherst.
Transformers PD, but I won't go there. <laughs> he successfully completed the department's field training and evaluation program this past week as well, and he too is assigned to the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. So if we can have all four of you step forward. Toward the mayor, the clerk will sign you in. Family, you want to step up and take pictures? Feel free, please. Okay. Raise your right hand for me. I <laughs> Who solemnly swear? Who solemnly swear? To faithfully and impartially. Faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of police officer. Discharge the duties of police officer. In the Northampton Police Department. In the Northampton Police Department. In accordance with the rules and laws of the police department. In accordance with the rules and laws of the police department. The Constitution of this Commonwealth. The Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the ordinances of the City of Northampton. In the ordinances of the city of Northampton. To the best of my knowledge and ability. To the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, gentlemen. Congratulations. So as a quick comment, um, just recently we are in the process of uh, hiring two new officers, um, both experienced, both trained, that have decided to come here and leave their, uh, where they're working now, uh, smaller departments that come to the Northampton Police Department. They're in their final stages. I think they're starting in the field training program in about a week. So that will leave us just two officers down um, after hopefully both of them succeed in our program. So. Awards. Captain Savino is going to assist me on this. All good. All right. <clears throat> Again, these are the 2011 awards. We tried to get in earlier in this year. It didn't quite happen. Uh, and this award involves Officer Brian D'Amico. Staff Sergeant Alan Borowski, Officer Justin Hooten, Officer Chris Edler, Officer Paul Margay, Officer Stephen Leiser. Some are working. Just Al? You're doing this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Officer D'Amico, who is the primary player in this incident, um, has uh, left to work with the Sherborne, Massachusetts Police Department, so he was invited here. This occurred on uh, February 19, 2011. Uh, the officers were called to assist the Massachusetts State Police with what the trooper thought was initially a routine traffic stop on King Street. The trooper, unfortunately, was faced with a gentleman with a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol, um, was threatening suicide, and clearly set himself up for a police officer-assisted suicide. If you don't know what that term is, it's where someone can't pull the trigger themselves, but they would like someone else to do it for them. Officer D'Amico, one of the first Northampton officers in the scene, initiated verbal contact with the individual, uh, with the operator, uh, throughout a protracted, almost hour-long event. Uh, D'Amico remained calm and provided clear instructions. While D'Amico was engaging the individual, other officers were securing the area, blocking off the intersection. This was at King and Finn Street, uh, securing the neighborhood in case this individual escaped from the vehicle. It could bring harm to other people. Staged uh, EMS in case the uh, the shooting actually did occur. So all the work officers working that I just listed uh, worked <clears throat> together cohesively as a unit, and eventually the situation was peacefully resolved. He surrendered without any shots being fired. It allowed for a safe outcome for both the operator and for the officers. Officer D'Amico will receive the award of meritorious service, and the other officers are receiving certificates of commendations for their actions. And the only one that here tonight is Sergeant Borowski. Thank you very much. You're the individual in charge of the scene. I appreciate it. I'm sure all these counselors appreciate it. Thank you, Chief.
Officer Sean Casella. Step forward, please. This is an incident May 11th of 2011. <clears throat> Officers on duty were dispatched to a mail armed with a knife robbing the TD Bank North on Main Street. Uh, upon the arrival of Officer Casella, he observed the suspect exiting the bank. Officer Casella gave chase on foot, tackled the suspect down the block. Uh, this caused both the knife and the money to be dislodged from the suspect's jacket. After a struggle and the arrival of other officers, they subsequently arrived on scene. The suspect was eventually taken into custody. Um, I remember this because I heard the call. I was in my office. I walked up to Main Street. The guy went that way instead of this way. Um, but it's an example of all the officers just pulling together to uh, deal with a serious situation. So Officer Casella did a wonderful job. I was right there. I saw it all. So Officer Casella, he is being awarded the Department's Meritorious Service Award. This incident is May 20th, 2011. This is Sergeant Alan Borowski again. Back for this, Al. <laughs> Officer Kenny Kirchner. <laughs> Kenny is still on crutches um, as a result of this. He's been out of work. He, he had serious knee injuries. He's had multiple surgeries. Um, still more surgeries to come. Um, we were hoping he'd be here, but He's, he's having a tough time from the result of the injuries he received from this. Officer Brian D'Amico aforementioned the incident on King Street. Sherburn, he's not here. We have Officer Tom Briata, Officer Nick D Dimitrian, and Officer Sean Kinsella again. Step forward, please. This was a incident. Officers were dispatched to report a disturbance on Pleasant Street uh, near Pearl. Uh, it was a major brawl going on. Uh, in the chaos, it was subsequently discovered that one of the in involved parties in the brawl was in possession of a handgun. While attempting to secure this suspect, a violent struggle ensued with the suspect, made even more dangerous with the fact that multiple individuals uh, were interfering with the officers trying to affect the arrest of the male with a handgun. The individual fled, ditched the handgun, he was eventually arrested, the handgun was covered. Uh, one of my officers was serious hurt, a couple of officers uh, not so seriously but still injured. Officers on the scene were finally able to gain control with multiple arrests being made and the scene secured. Uh, so for all their work, uh, this group is receiving the Unit Citation Award. Next incident, 1225 2011, Christmas Day. On duty officers originally, can call him up, Sergeant Borowski again. <laughs> <laughs> Staff Sergeant Robert Powers. Detective Peter Fapiano is also out injured. I'm not, I didn't see him. I don't think he's here. He's on crutches. Detective Corey Robinson. He's been very busy over the past mm -hmm. 24 hours. Officer Andrew Cole. Negative, John Perry. Negative, <laughs> Officer Briata. Morgan. Joseph Golick. Andrew Carney. <coughs> Steve DiGiamo. Brett Noyes. Did Brett make it? Brett is now employed with the Wilbraham Police Department. On Christmas Day 2011, on duty officers originally responded to a report of a female intruder inside a residence on Massasoit Street. 
who was armed with a handgun and hiding behind their Christmas tree when the family came home. Working together, officers and detectives began securing the scene, interviewing wit witnesses and victims, gathered evidence, and eventually located and arrested the subject. So as a result of this group team work, even on Christmas Day, um, they're out there protecting the public. They're all receiving a certificate of commendation for their work that evening. So a lot of Not on my list. Sorry about that. Across the street, they all came to all right. We don't have any particular. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Officer Brett Morgan. Brett. Thanks, sir. Thank you. 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 Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good job. Thanks. 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 Officer Corrupta responded to a report of a domestic dispute where one of the involved parties, a juvenile, had left the area prior to his arrival. A short time later, Officer Corrupta loaded, uh, lo loaded, yeah, located the distraught male who was now threatening to jump off the bridge in South Street into the Mill River. The river at this time was raging due to the heavy rains that had passed through Northampton. The male was standing on the river side of the railing. Without disregard to his own saf safety, Officer Corrupta secured one of the juvenile's arms, eventually pulling up and back over the railing to safety. Officer Corrupta's decisive action surely saved the young man's life, and for that action, he is hereby awarded the Life Saving Medal. John Cartilage, please. This is a city award, a City of Northampton Certificate of Excellence. This is presented to Lieutenant John Cartilage for the outstanding dedication and effort in preparing and coordinating the entire department for the assessment procedure, resulting in the successful completion of the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission. Throughout this period, which was well over a year, John exhibited a professional, patient, and diplomatic presence, vigilantly attending to the arduous task of ensuring that the department was up to date with the current accreditation standards and then fit facilitating the resolution of any and all post-assessment issues that had to be addressed. So John, Lieutenant, for your efforts, you are hereby presented with the City of Northampton Certificate of Excellence, signed by David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. And I want to thank you. I want to show you what a great group of people you have working for you for the police department. The entire awards process, if you recall, is completely peer driven. There are awards that are people are recommended for by their fellow officers, by their supervisors. They go through a screening process, and a committee of their peers, the officers, sit on the awards committee. Many more people are nominated, very few get the awards. I'm, I'm shocked sometimes how hard the peer group is about, now nah, that's just part of your job. Which means there's a lot of other really great stories out there that we don't tell, serious calls that they go on, people's lives that they save, things that in our world are part of your job and go without recognition. 
So this is the best of the best. We bring it forward to you every year so you can see that and understand that it's, again, all the peer evaluation that the decisions are made. They make the recommendations to me. And like I said, sometimes I'm like, you really screen that one out? You know, I mean, it, it's amazing. They're really hard on themselves, but it shows that the respect that they have for the work that they do and how proud they are to serve the city of Northampton. So I thank you for your time tonight. And um, Chief, before you go, I, I know several counselors want to add their thanks. Uh, to, and I just want to thank you and thank the department and congratulate our new members of the department, congratulate the newly promoted members, and thank all of our officers, including the ones who've been recognized tonight especially, but all of our officers. Well, you, you can see many people got awards and many poor, uh, many more showed up to support them. Exactly. So, so it's, it's we, we, we thank have a great group all. serving you. Um, I can't be prouder of them as, as, as every one of the employees, so. Exactly. I want to recognize Councilor Adams. <laughs> As, as chair of public safety, I was lucky enough to have sat in on the sergeant, or, or been on the interview panel for the sergeant and lieutenant interviews, and um, and each candidate was extremely impressive. The choices weren't easy, and we're lucky to have the the level of, of professionalism and commitment to the community that we do with respect to them and to the recipient of all the awards, and to the entire uh, police department. And I'm reminded almost on a daily basis of just how lucky we am to have the force that we do. And I thank you, chief, and the entire department. Councilor Tacey, and then Councilor Department. Yeah, Chief, I've always said it. Uh, our department is user-friendly and second to none. We have great cops, and um, it has a lot to do with the leadership, too. Thank you. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, thank you. Um, chief Sinkowitz, I want to thank you for being our chief, and I want to thank the men and women working for your department. They have just been excellent. They, the way they communicate with, I have to say, with my residents and probably all the other wards throughout the city, they are just super. And I want to thank all of them, even the new ones coming on board, that I will keep you busy in Ward 6. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the night shift, but, <laughs> 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 but anyway, I want to thank your department and thank you as the chief for keeping all of us safe. Thank you. On uh, behalf of all my people, I thank you for your comments. Uh, Council President. Very briefly, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, being a police officer is a job that's fraught with boredom, for one, but then after that, moments punctuated by intense adrenaline boosts and possibly dread, terror, and all the other things that associate, all the things that we'd much rather prefer as citizens to ever confront in our lives. And those are the moments. I, I appreciate the boring moments. I appreciate the reports. I appreciate the work and the effort and the energy. And I'm and I'm glad that we do this. I actually I you know I'd feel even better if there are more pomp and circumstance somehow associated with it. But the fact is that I I, I really do I, I am I'm enormously grateful for this department and everything that and all the work and energy they provide for the community. Anyone else? Thank you again, Chief. And thank, thank you all. So um, the next item on your agenda, uh, we also have a number of appointments uh, to committees, um, both appointments and reappointments. Uh, First, one is a new appointment. Uh, this is Jenna Sujat of 97 Laurel Park in Northampton to the Arts Council. This would be a term from October 2012 to October 2015. She would be replacing Dana Wild. This requires a believe, move to refer to appointment. Second. Evaluations. All those in favor of referring, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions. Okay. Uh, the next item is um, a reappointment. This is to the Central Business Architecture Committee. This is Robert Walker of 13 Fort Street, Northampton, uh, a term from April 2011 to April 2014. Um, again, he is a current serving member, and I am reappointing him to another term. To suspend Rule 31. Second. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made I mean, second to, to suspend the rules. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a motion to appoint? Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, 
so there's been a motion made and seconded to reappoint Robert Thank Walker you. to the Central Business Architecture Committee. Is there any discussion or comments on that? Council? Just, um, when, again, when we're doing the reappoint, we have tried to do um, both our job on the committee, which is to make sure that reappointments uh, are people who are active members and are members in good standing with the committee. I know the mayor's office also looks at that. Um, and Robert Walker has been a, a, a Councilor uh, Murphy may be able to tell us, but I think Councilor uh, Robert Walker has been on this committee for how many years? Quite a, quite a while, right? Several terms. And has and been he does always known as a very good job yeah. on the committee. So we'd like to uh, move it forward tonight. Yes. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor of reappointing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is actually just a correction to an appointment term. Uh, this is to the Conservation Commission, R. Downey Meyer. Uh, his, his reappointment, I believe, uh, when it was recently done, um, there yes. was an uh, error on the term. So this would correct that. This would be R. Downey Meyer, 516 North Farms Road, Florence, a term of March 2012. To March 2015. Move to approve. Is there Second. A second. Is there any question? Council. What was the error? <coughs> What's that? We had had it to 2014 oh, okay. originally. Uh, so we only <coughs> have the full length of the term. The longer the better. There you go. Uh, any other questions about this? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next item is a reappointment uh, to the Committee on Disabilities. This is Victoria Eklund of 1067 Burt's Pit Road in Florence. Uh, she's a full member, and th her term would be from August 2011 to August 2014. Move to suspend Rule 30. Second. Okay. We've got a motion made and seconded to suspend rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, I would just like to back. talk a little bit about. Did you make a motion to appoint? To um, appoint. appoint. Second. Okay. And seconded. Okay, Councillor. Um, Victoria, she has been on the Committee on Disabilities for quite a long time, and she's a great asset. She um, was voted in several, several months ago as vice chair. Very active. She has been working on the Braille menu, she brought it up last year and her and I have been working very closely on it and we're coming to some great success here with the Braille menus. So that's why we're suspending this rule because she's very active on our committee. She's there all the time. Any other uh, comments or questions about this uh, reappointment? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that completes the appointment selections on public hearing portion of your agenda. Uh, we will now um, uh, recess the regular meeting and move into the finance committee. And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the finance committee. Can you have this? Present. Here. Present. Here. Here. Uh, the first order is um, uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee order that whereas chapter 30b of the massachusetts general laws requires disposal of surplus city personal property with an estimated value less than five thousand dollars according to written procedures approved by the city council and whereas the city of northampton procedures need updating now, therefore, be it ordered that the following procedures are approved for disposal of surplus property with an estimated value of less than $5,000. Surplus property disposal. Disposal of surplus property with an estimated value of less than $5,000 and more than $100 must be approved by the supervising board or commission of the department disposing of the surplus property. If there is no supervising board or commission appro approval, Approval shall be obtained from the mayor. The rep responsible department head may seek three quotes from firms in the business of buying such property or such surplus property may be auctioned using a public online auction website. Records of surplus property disposal shall be retained for six years. 
For disposal of surplus property with a value of less than $100, the responsible department head shall use sound business practices. Is there a motion to recommend? Second. Okay. Um, so this is actually an update of a policy that this council approved. And the one major difference is um, I would like to see it updated to include the availability of online auction sites. Um, we have a, there's actually one that's uh, now becoming quite common in Massachusetts and throughout New England called Municibid, which is where um, cities and towns can put surplus equipment on there. Um, and so, and what happens is people bid on them. Um, and so in talking with our procurement um, officer about whether we could move to this, he felt that we should update our policy uh, to reflect that um, so that it would be considered um, in keeping with our an electronic bid versus a written bid that the two would, would hold the same weight. Um, uh, the fire department recently wanted to get rid of an old vehicle um, and municipal bid, they were instantly able to get five, six, seven different bids from other communities who wanted that vehicle. Um, and we've, uh, as we move into a situation where we're going to start possibly surplusing cruisers um, as opposed to recycling them within the city, this will allow us another avenue for being able to do that. Councillor LaBarge and then yes. Councillor Mayor, in a paragraph here, it states the responsible department head may seek three quotes from firms in the business of buying whatever such property. Mm -hmm. May seek. Why just may? I mean, shouldn't it just be three quotes? That's it? Uh, uh, typically, uh, they what what the procurement officer told me is that you know depending on the nature of the item so for example I think if it was a vehicle for example um, what often may happen is he may may contact junkyards or may contact salvage yards or may contact um, you know multiple ones to see which would which would provide a better quote in some cases there it may be a specialized item um, so it's not a it's not a legal requirement under Mass General Law to have um, to, to get quotes for something under five thousand dollars just like when we go out to spend we don't have to we don't have to uh, get quotes for something um, less than five thousand um, dollars I think it's put in there as a sort of a practice a good business practice that they could follow as a way to ensure that we're getting the best price and my understanding is in, in most cases they do seek the best you know they try to seek different prices or bids on it so that they can make sure we get the best value. Thank you. Councilor? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Susan White I think say another reason for the word may is one department may be surplusing it, but it might be going to another department. So it's not always going to go out to bid. And why would it be that the records um, have to be retained for six years? Why six years? That's procurement statute. law. Statute. For the law. Just so that we can have a record and be able to show that we what pr practice we followed when the equipment was surplus and sold. Thank you. And, uh, I kind of like the. Oh. Yeah, I had uh, relinquished for a second there. Just <laughs> I kind of like the word may rather than shall rather than to muddy the waters and try to tie anybody's hands where they shall need three bids. Mm -hmm. um, but my question would be, do we try to sell it or or? Uh, see from other communities if they want this equipment before we sell it to the public or are we always looking for the best price I think I think it probably depends on the item I mean municipal is open to any other community that, and it's free um, but also members of the public can go on it as well I mean it's a bit yeah I think it really depends on what the what the item is um, okay. you know we recently had some some old um, fire hose that was you know not of great value and um, actually one of your constituents had an interest in it yep. and it really wasn't of a certain value um, and they actually came to us and said could we buy some of that old damaged fire hose so that was sort of a specialized situation where we went ahead and did it It was for a civic group okay um, so I think it, it's it's all over the map so but obviously if we can help out another municipality that's always a preference to do that yeah, I just want to make sure that we're getting the best dollar exactly for it yeah even even not helping out other community yeah for our own community well, that's why this municipal bid has kind of taken that sort of it's sort of like eBay for free municipalities yeah. so you okay. are able to put something out for auction for a certain number of days all the bids come in and then you can select who you want to uh, sell your property to okay thank you yeah. Councillor Freeman uh, thank you um, 
I am not, I'm not really curious about that may in the uh, second to last sentence there. Isn't it, isn't the may modifying the two options that the department head has? That's right. Either That's right. seek three bids yep. or put it on an auction? Right. That's correct. So, so it's not may seek three bids. You're right. It's may, may do one or the two choices. That, you're correct. So, um, shall. So, See, on, that's so what you have to you have to get at least three, three. Um, that's what bothered me. So, so should it be? I mean, do you want to change the May to shall or put yes. a colon after May to show that it's that we're, that the May modifies? I think the, the two um, clauses rather than the than the. Uh, I guess I'd, the I first clause. How about this? Must this is the go. this was the original one said May as well. I know, but it was, an op it was an optional because again, we're not requ they're not required by Mass General Law to do that, but we've put it in there as an option. Um, well, I, I we could keep May. Just put a col if you put a colon after May, then it that it it works just as well. May colon. no no see no, it doesn't make sense right. Or you could put May it either. And yeah, or. May May colon yes. Oh. I, trust me, it makes sense. English English major. Okay, so a not a semicolon, but a colon. Yeah, that's correct. Colon. Okay, so um, so we can uh, we can do that um, when it comes out to the full city council. Um, did you have a question? A further question? Shall. No. I do. Yes. Councillor um, Owen Freeman's Daniel is asking to have a colon put after May. Is that what you're asking for, Councillor? <laughs> Well, if, if you want to keep the word may, yes. I really don't like the word may. Well, do you like colons? I don't like <laughs> colons either. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> any other discussion C3. about this? Any other comments about it? Yeah, it just bothers me that on here it states the responsible department had may seek three quotes. I don't like that may. I like must. <laughs> if, if I may, Steve, if we're gonna if we're gonna parse the language and we're gonna work on the grammar here, may actually sets up the fact that there's two choices here after the colon that, that uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels is referring to. The colon actually indicates that there's a list. There's two options. So when you say may, it's may seek either three quotes from firms of business buying the property, or such uh, surplus property may be auctioned using the public uh, online auction website. So that it, it, no. Councilor Freeman Daniels is correct. It is get, providing you with two options after the colon that, that those are the two choices that are uh, uh, iterated here in the in the language. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that if you want to say must, then that means they are compelled to do both. That would be great. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the it reason make any sense. Are using this a bit is that's it's, fine. It's more efficient than right. the old-fashioned way. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Call around <laughs> and, and, see. and 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 if it if it's of of, of a special concern to to counselors, then I would refer it uh, for uh, after our approval, hopefully that uh, to the solicitor. To well, this will require two readings. So okay. I can so in the intervening time, I can see clarification from the procurement officer about this may versus shall. Uh, controversy. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way, I think the shall work would work just as well. Uh, put a shall with a colon after it, or I being like equally that confused with a shall without a colon. Jesse, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Counselor, wouldn't the shall <coughs> make them do both? The colon would give them. The colon shall will indicate that this is a list of things. You do That's what shall the mayor do just either. said. Shall do either. either or. Right. Yeah. I'm not splitting hairs. Well, I, 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 I <laughs> appreciate the mayor's shall. Anyway. shall. Yeah. And again, I, I can I can get a clarification because I must I have to apologize. I, mean, I sought this from the procurement officer on very short notice prior to putting the agenda together. So um, he may not have looked at deeply into the grammatical implications of his uh, well. choice of words. So we'll figure <laughs> that out. Um, we'll put we'll put a red mark in the margin and okay. to research it. We shall, we shall <laughs> put the colon so, out. But first, we need to have it recommended out of finance committee yes. before we can undertake that. Uh, so there's like a motion the made and seconded. So yeah. are we okay to recommend yes. all those yeah. in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay, so that will come out to the full council. Um, okay, the next item. Upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, order that $73,800 in cash capital funds remaining from a 2008 appropriation for the acquisition and repair of the Massachusetts Highway Division salt shed are no longer needed for that purpose and are hereby transferred to the following DPW projects. $50,000 for repairs to the floor of the DPW garage used for equipment storage. $23,800 for professional land survey and legal services associated with accepting selected private ways as public ways. Move to approve. Seconds of discussion. Okay. I'd like to ask also to recognize. Uh, to recognize Ned Huntley. Move to recognize. All those in favor of recognizing DPW Director Huntley say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Huntley. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, you can start off with the garage barns. Behind you up on the screen, uh, this is a computer diagram of the, the barns themselves in its entirety all the way around. This area here is the garage storage area. This is the mechanics bay here, and this is where the superintendents and the workers in the sewer department are. These hatched in areas in black are voids underneath the floor that um, actually <coughs> collapsed this past year in January on us. And what we found out that these areas are about four feet deep and about five feet wide, and um, they're hollow underneath, and they, they don't support our equipment very well as uh, you know, a truck fell through it. So our proposal is to utilize some monies from this transfer from the, uh, this other capital improvement project into this to secure the, uh, the, at least the garage area for the winter for storage of vehicles. Uh, when this happened in January, we had a very mild year. We left vehicles out for the rest of the winter because of this. Uh, this is an active area in the wintertime where we have our sanders stored with sand and salt ready to go, and we can't do that without this fix. This other wall here is also used for heavy trucks here. They're parked in diagonally. They come in and out. And these two bays are run-through bays where vehicles are stacked uh, lengthwise for uh, speedy delivery during winter events. Uh, we figured um, the cost of this was about $140,000 to contract this out for the garage area. And it was about another $120,000 to do the area underneath the mechanics bay. And then there's some asbestos abatement that needs to be done inside the garage area also. So we're looking at about a $270,000 project total. What the DPW has proposed to the mayor is that allow that DPW staff undertake fixing the voids underneath the garage space area, uh, which we can do on weekends, and contract out the work for delivery of materials. And that way, DPW can get this done in relatively short order over a period of weekends and get this back ready for the winter. Uh, if we have to go out to bid and do Chapter 149 procurement, designer selection services, we're talking another year before this thing gets fixed. The mechanics area is a different story. Uh, there's a huge uh, mold remediation issue that needs to be done underneath that floor. We can't undertake that work ourselves internal to the department. So that $120,000 is going to have to be bid out as a Chapter 149 project in the future. The other part of the funds that we're looking for tonight is the $23,800 for private ways. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, everyone has private ways in their wards. We're working diligently uh, to either convert these private ways into public ways or to leave them as private ways going forward and provide no services on them. So because of that, uh, no one in the department has a land surveying license, so we need to hire those professional services outside to create layout plans for the roadways, which are required for the recording in the registry of deeds, and any legal services that we might incur also as part of this um, transfer of private ways into public ways. Are, you, are there any other photos? Or There's some photos in the back of this also. Yes, please. I don't know if you wanted to just finish your presentation. Sure, very quickly. Um, these are the void spaces that are underneath the barns. They're actually hollow caverns that run the entire length almost of the barns themselves. I brought in, I think, uh, six photos total. Next, Mary. Uh, here's some other ones. These are some of the columns that actually support the uh, roofs of the building here. They're also under this area also. And lastly, the last photos, uh, just another example of what's underneath our floor at the DPW. Why were the, those two 
bays there in the first place? We're not sure. It was a trolley barn. The trolleys themselves are light. It's part of the uh, Northampton Railway System. Uh, the mechanics area, there was a turn turntable down there for turning engines. That's where the engines were worked on. But these were the through areas for uh, trolley work. It also, my understanding, served as a bus garage for a, a quite a period of time. <coughs> and what we found in one of the bays about eight years ago, it actually had a pit in it where you could walk underneath a vehicle and work on like you see a jiffy loop. Whether it was used for that, we're not quite sure, but they're hollow underneath and we need to take care of them. Counselor. And Counselor. Yep. The, I, I read the Tigan Bond report in uh, there was only at the very the last two lines were about the mold. Yes. Um, and I didn't see anything about asbestos in that report. Um, it is in there. Is it, it in is. there? Yes, I saw it. Yes, it oh. is. Okay, I, I, I must have missed it. But the hundred twenty thousand dollars is that just for the mold? No, that's for mold and to fix the slab underneath. To bring mold it. and the slab. Right. So it's it's fixing everything in that area. But like I said, that's out of our expertise to deal with mold remediation. Yeah. Okay. And do we have, does the city, the city must have utilized somebody before. Do we have any, any experience with a different, with a contractor on the mold remediation that we know of? I'm sure central services may have used them for some of our old okay. buildings. Um, and, but we'd, we'd still have, we'd still be subject to the yep. state law, procurement law. So sure. We'd have to go out to bid. Okay. Council. Thank you. Ned, on that 23800 for professional land survey, you don't have surveyors in your department? You don't have licensed land surveyors in-house? You don't have a PLS? No, we do not. There hasn't been a PLS in-house since, um, geez, I think it was George Quinn. We have professional, uh, professional engineers, no land surveyors. It probably would be something to think about because you could save some money. Well, the sparse use that we have of professional services like that, I'd be, I think, fairly expensive to bring a professional land surveyor on board full time for part time work. Councilor Adams. Similarly, um, the legal services, is that for outside counsel? It'd be for more, yes, outside counsel Not or city solicitor paying for some legal services that might be associated with some of these conversions. Do you anticipate our solicitor? Doing most of it or all of it. He does have he does have land and title folks that that work with him and his firm. Um, but again, we this isn't accounted for in our budget, and because it's would be uh, typically what we're we we this would be essentially help to pay for those services, which would effectively kind of be billed to the DPW, um, and so this would help pay for those services Thank you. that are sort of above and beyond. And I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but could you go over just exactly why for everybody that we're not utilizing that money for the salt shed? Um, there's actually $150,000 appropriated, I think, in Capital Improvements Plan 08 <clears throat> to uh, purchase a new salt shed for the Mass DOT yard next door when we were looking at taking over that property. Uh, that, that acquisition has fallen apart due to potential outstanding liabilities on the on the site that we don't know about and don't want to undertake as a city. So we told uh, Mass Dot that we'd like to not go forward with the project. We'd like them to clean up their property, and then if they do surplus it, we would be interested in a conversation with them again once those liabilities have been cleaned up. So with that, it freed up this $75,000 on the capital improvement side. There's also $75,000 that we're going to be putting by solid waste because that's where we're looking at putting a new transfer station and move it out of our, our facility at 125 Locust Street. And the conversation is still ongoing with the acquisition. I, yeah, and I, I, mean, I, I can, I mean, I essentially, there, there had been a deal brokered by the previous administration, yep. and I, uh, I reviewed it, reviewed it with our new city solicitor, and I made the decision to not, to not move forward with the deal. Um, part of the deal involved our building this salt shed and it was all in an effort to try to make the cost sort of a cost neutral um, transa transaction between us and the state. Uh, and uh, I, I was uncomfortable and, and with, with moving forward with the acquisition because there's a landfill that we would be purchasing as part of the deal. Uh, That's right. That yep. we, um, still we're not 100% sure about what liability we'd be taking on. So, um, and so now this part of the deal is no longer necessary. And actually, interestingly, I think MassDOT sort of, I don't know that they actually needed this salt shed to begin with, but it was sort of put together as, a, as part of the package.
package. So well, there's a salt shed on site. They use it for overflow for yeah. emergency use only. Yeah. And if the transfer did take place, that salt shed was in the middle of the portion that we were going to acquire. Yeah. And so they wanted to move that. They couldn't move the building, so they asked us to buy a new one. We were looking at taking their old salt shed and making a u reuse center and basically to store materials for resale. I'm happy to see it thrown out there because I was never really on board with buying that land. And I'm disappointed because I was supportive of of, this, of the DPW acquiring the land. It would have given us some some good opportunities, but the, I just the unknowns were too high, and and the liability. So what the director's right. We said you go ahead and clean up the property, and then we'll have a conversation with you about acquiring it in the future. So we'll see what happens. I didn't mean to bring all that into the. I, That's fine. I just, had, no, to, I just that, had to hear it again. It's relevant. It's yeah. completely relevant. So, and so that these funds really are, this is a project that's not going to move forward. So we feel it's appropriate to use it for this other DPW-related project. Thank you. And this is just money that's already been appropriated and? It's already been appropriated. It's cash perfect. capital. It's not borrowed money. It's perfect. It's, uh, so it's, it's, it's there. Councillor Adams, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Okay. Any other councillors? Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Um, would, we don't. We. I just want to no. clarify. We don't need. Great. No. We don't need you to stay for the regular meeting. So. Thank you. Thank you. Unless he wants to. <laughs> uh, I think there's a Boy Scout meeting. He needs to get. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay. So in finance committee, um, all those in favor of recommending this to the full council, say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. Okay, and then I will uh, turn it over to the finance director if you have any other updates to add. No, I just, you saw my memo, which basically just outlined the actions you just mm -hmm. took. Um, next meeting, I will give you a first quarter report on revenues and expenditures. Okay. Councilor. Very good. Thank you. I like this um, and all these. Thank you. Okay. Um, any new business in the finance committee? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in aye. favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we have adjourned the Finance Committee. And now we will return to the regular agenda of the City Council. Under reports of committees, you have the minutes of the Transportation and Parking Commission for August 21st, 2012. Move to Acceptance. Approve. Second. Okay. Um, any comments or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so those are accepted. Uh, now, sir, did you? I just noticed that our representative from Hampshire, Cog, is here. We might Excellent. want to take Most an order out of order. Most definitely. I'm, uh, as much as I'm sure he'd like to sit through another city council <laughs> meeting. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's, exactly. he's, I know. He's, he uh, serves on, and yes. you know, he's a selectman. Excellent. So I, that, that's a great idea. So we will um, we will move out of order then um, to uh, this is the final order on the agenda for the evening. This is um, uh, authorization. Just one moment. Okay. So this is upon the recommendation of the Energy and Sustainability Commission, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, Councillor Pamela Schwartz, Councillor William Dwight, and Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels. Ordered that whereas the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, by enacting Chapter 164 of the Acts of 1997, has established a competitive marketplace through deregulation and restructuring of the electric utility industry, and whereas the citizens of the City of Northampton and Hampshire County have substantial economic, environmental, and social interests at stake, and whereas Northampton's residential and business consumers are interested in reducing their electricity rates, and whereas Northampton is committed to a 20% reduction in total community energy consumption by 2020, now therefore be it ordered, the City Council grants the Mayor authority to develop and participate in a contract or contracts for power supply and other related services in joint action with other municipalities through the Hampshire Council of Government. If such contracts are to be approved, individual consumers would retain the option not to participate and to choose any alternative service they desire. 
and the mayor is further authorized to develop an energy plan in consultation with the Energy and Sustainability Commission and the Hampshire Council of Governments and to take any and all actions necessary to implement an aggregation program, an energy program, that is consistent with this order, the requirements of the Utility Restructuring Act, and will invest between 40 and 60 percent of any annual average energy cost savings toward energy conservation and production of renewable energy in Northampton. Move to approve. Second. Second. Seconded. Okay. Um, so we've had a motion made and seconded. Are there any, is there any discussion? And again, we have a representative from the Hampshire Council of Governments who's here to answer any questions about this. Um, hearing no, no, oh, Councillor. I just, uh, full, full disclosure, I use uh, Northampton's, uh, I use electricity in the city of Northampton and I'll be taking advantage of this, uh, this uh, change in electric uh, supply. Thank you. Okay. A little more public disclosure there. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments about this? Okay. He doesn't have to invoke any necessity, does he? I don't believe so. Um, <laughs> Uh, unless all of you start making that disclosure, then we may have to make <laughs> necessity. Um, okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? It's unanimously accepted. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are also welcome to stay. <sighs> we'll go sit in your meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so okay. we'll go back to the regular order of the agenda, um, and we are on financial orders. Um, this again is in City Council. Uh, this is uh, on the recommendation of the Mayor and the Finance Committee, and this is the adoption of an updated surplus property disposal policy for a property under uh, $5,000 and more than $100. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And again, I will seek clarification between now and second reading on the specifics of the may versus shall. Okay. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay. The next item is uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the city council. This is ordered that 73800 in cash capital funds remaining from a 2008 appropriation for the acquisition and repair of the Mass Highway Division salt shed are no longer needed and are hereby transferred to the following projects. 50000 for repairs to the floor of the DPW garage and 23800 for professional land survey and legal services. Move to approve it. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 And I wonder would it, if we, if I could request a two readings on this item because that would allow the DPW to actually get started on the project within October, and the goal is to be able to get it done in time for moving that equipment, uh, loaded salt uh, sanders and salt trucks into that barn. Just suspend like two suspend readings rule. It is, it, I think it's imperative that they do it. Definitely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So there's been a motion made and seconded to suspend rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Now I'll entertain a motion on second reading. Second. So moved to approve. Okay. It's been seconded. All those in favor on second reading say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. That was rule 14, is that right? Yes. Uh, that is correct. Suspension of rule 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This is upon the recommendation of, uh, this is a second reading. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development and the Finance Committee. <clears throat> Ordered that whereas Northampton zoning requires that private development projects above certain thresholds make transportation improvements to mitigate traffic impacts that are reasonably related to the development, and whereas zoning allows developers to voluntarily make a payment in accordance with a formula in the zoning in lieu of making such improvements with the payment to cover mitigation reasonably related to the project, and whereas said funds may only be used for transportation mitigation reasonably related to the development and in accordance with any conditions imposed by the planning board in approving the development project. And whereas the city has established a traffic mitigation gift account administered by the Office of Planning and Development to accept pet said payment in lieu of transportation improvements, donations, and payments. Now therefore be it ordered that city council authorizes the city acting through its Office of Planning and Development to accept donations, gifts, and payments to the traffic mitigation account and further, City Council authorizes the following expenditures to the extent that funds are available to cover such expenditures. $13,797.53 for traffic covering and mitigation between Bridge Street and Hockenham Road. 
$37,375 for improvements and new access to the Manhan Rail Trail. $4,449.67 for traffic mitigation in the State Street and Elm Street areas. $40,340 for traffic calming and mitigation in the Leeds neighborhood north of Florence Street. $8,100 for traffic calming and mitigation off of Bridge Road in Florence. $2,000 for traffic calming and mitigation in the High Street Straw Avenue area. $26,000 for land acquisition design and improvements for a multi-use trail to connect to the ridge. $2,000 for traffic calming and mitigation in the Spring Street area. Uh, move approval. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, move to recognize Wayne Fiden, by the way. Second. Okay. All those in favor of recognize Mr. Fiden, say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Fiden. Thank you. Um, if you remember, you discussed this at your last meeting and approved some items. These items I want to bring back for a second meeting. Um, I don't know, I had a meeting with um, Councilor Freeman Daniels and, and Councilor Dwight. I don't know if you want to talk about sure. your proposed yeah. change. Um, Councilor. Thank you. Uh, uh, earlier this week, uh, Councilor Dwight and I met with uh, Director Fiden and we, um, we, we talked about some of the issues that we, we had uh, last month and um, Mr. Fight and I went through each project that uh, off off of uh, not not in the PowerPoint uh, not not on the, on the Finance Committee's time and um, some of them uh, Director Fight and told me you know they have some conceptual ideas but nothing nothing firm yet and uh, I was I, I my personally I'm not comfortable uh, issuing approval to to spend the funds for for something that the council hasn't seen yet so um i'm proposing a uh an amendment to to this and it's on your desk it's the second uh, page there um that uh that takes away um from approval a lot of uh, the, the expenditure of a lot of the um smaller uh funds uh with the exception maybe of the forty thousand dollars on um, the Leeds neighborhood north of Florence Street, but but it also tries to get at what one of the problems is, which is that um, planning will often see some opportunities, uh, but doesn't know if they're real or not until it spends a little money on a, a feasibility study or an engineering plan or something like that. So um, the two plans that are that really have um, good process. Uh, or have progressed good progress are is the thirty seven thousand three hundred seventy five for um, new access to the Manhan Rail Trail and twenty six thousand for land acquisition design and improvements for multi use trail to connect to the ridge and then um, w we worked out kind of a uh, a general order which would uh, set which says generally the Office of Planning Development uh, th the city through its through OPD um, can ex generally expend funds for any eligible project for design, feasibility studies, planning, and engineering, but not for construction or acquisition. So the idea would be to allow, uh, for any of these projects, to allow uh, OPD at its discretion to spend some money on, on planning and design, but um, to, they would have to come before council with a specific project and a specific dollar amount in order to, uh, to build or, or to acquire land. So I, that's my amendment. So there's been an amendment made. Is there a second? I'll second the amendment. Okay, and then Councilor Dwight. The, uh, uh, first of all, um, I have to uh, extend my thanks to Wayne and Owen for working this out. In the intent, I think uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels' intent is appropriate. What he's suggesting is that let's not limit conceptualization and 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 you know in prospects mm -hmm. but at the same time have an opportunity to weigh at, at the appropriate time when it comes time to actually start to put shovels in grounds or stake out locations and things like that 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 money at that point would have to go through a public process of discussion of that and and to some degree uh, you know and, and Wayne and correct me if I'm wrong was perfectly fine with that in fact this actually clarifies a number of, uh, at least protocols in the way we approach these things so I mean, my concern I think Wayne's concern was also that we didn't want to stifle any con concept um, 
aspect of any projects. But at the, and so what uh, Council Freeman Daniels and uh, and Wayne have worked out here, I think, um, addresses those concerns and actually probably cleans up the process ultimately, and then um, improves public um, public access to the to the deliberation. Are there any other um, comments or questions about Just if Director Fiden wants to make any comment, any other comment other than that. No, I think it's a good approach. I'm very comfortable with it. You know, each project's different, so sometimes we come to you with projects that are fairly far along, and some projects, particularly bigger projects, we want to come to you early in the process to make sure you agree the direction we're going. But generally, this is fine. I want to also thank Director Fiden for... And I just want to, can I just clarify, make sure I'm clarifying this also that OPG will spend the funds, but it, even that's subject to my approval in terms of signing contracts, right. et cetera. So there's Absolutely. also, just want to be clear that it's not just. There is, there, that's right. Loans. There is, there is, a, there is still yeah. a continuation in the approval line. Yes. yes. And, and just as Cliff Everett, all, all the normal processes you've set in place exist. So when we're dealing with bicycle pedestrian projects, it also involves the bicycle pedestrian committee. When we're dealing with bigger projects, we you know, always bring transportation and parking commission in. Um, DPW is obviously involved or anything with their right of way. So all those other things will remain. This just sort of sets up the actual dollar amounts. So will this amendment then allow for those small projects that are mentioned here in this list? After all, such as the uh, 8100 for the uh, calming and mitigation of Bridge Road in Florence and the, uh, are these then allowed by this amendment? So if they were only design projects, yes. If they're bricks and mortar projects, they have to come back. And what are they as presented in the previous version? So we don't have that yet. They, the, the original version that we had before you was figuring the details that get worked out with Transportation and Parking Commission. Mm -hmm. So we're asking you to sign off and then leave it to Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, it, council wants to, it, council wants to be involved with the process. It's absolutely fine with us. So we don't really know exactly what those projects were okay. at this point. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Councilor? Yeah, it, <coughs> there was a lot of confusion about uh, these funds, mitigation funds and um, traffic calming. Um, it, it, traffic calming funds it requires an application. Is that correct? So there's two separate things going on, and they often share the same funds, and sometimes they're different. So there is a process for applying for traffic calming in the city, um, and that comes before transportation and parking, DPW studies them, and then prioritizes them. And there's a point system for how those things get funded. One of the many things in the point system is the actual availability of money. So there's some projects that in theory might be great projects for which there's just no money for. Um, so you get credit, for, you, you get this point system. Then separately from that, when certain projects are built in the city, they pay traffic mitigation funds. We can only use those monies for things which mitigate the impacts of those traffic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're separate. So for example, nobody put in a request for traffic calming to fix the intersection of North and King. But we had traffic mitigation money, and that was a logical intersection to fix. Sometimes there's an overlap, as in your ward, where there's money that came in from Beaver Brook subdivision, and, then, and there was a traffic calming request, so we could use the traffic mitigation money to help meet that traffic calming request. And at what point does the money come in from a particular project? I know that uh, Beaver Brook uh, Estates has come in, and the other one on Reservoir Road has not come in, which is the three lot Goggins subdivision. Right, right. Why does one come in and one not? Typically it has to do with how lumpy a project is. So a project where developer is doing the entire project at once, building a road at once, we typically require the monies up front. A project that has a clear phasing plan, so, so uh, Reservoir Road's a good example. They built the first home, but the last home they haven't built yet, and they may never build. So they're not required to pay that portion of the traffic mitigation until they actually build, pull a building permit. So if you're building a road, because that road automatically generates traffic, you have to pay the traffic mitigation funds up front. If you're doing a project that might be phased over a long time, you can typically pay them over some time period. Well, that could be said for a subdivision, too. Uh, houses aren't built instantly. Right. Who knows? Maybe the last 10 houses on Beaver Brook might not get built. That's right, right. And so it often happens. So, so I mean, we, do we pick and choose on, on how we 
uh, assess this money? To, how do we collect this money? If this project has been approved at this point, shouldn't we collect the money? So it, 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 that's what where the planning board works out during the public process. So you, to give you another project, the, what used to be called the Oaks, now it's called Emerson Way. Their traffic mitigation is $100,000. They paid $50,000 up front before they ever opened their doors. That was what Doug called. That's correct. And that paid for the connection for the bike path from Ice Pond Road to uh, Rocky Hill. They still owe $50,000, which won't happen until they get to a certain phase in the project. So subdivisions often are phased. Um, sometimes up to the developer. Sometimes developers want to pay it all up front and be done with it. And sometimes they ask to have them phased. So ph phasing is usually what we do. Some developers choose not to go there. So how much do we, how much could we possibly realize out of the Reservoir Road subdivision? Um, I'd have to look up the numbers. It's not much because only a couple of homes that are left. I think it's $4,000, but I'd need to look it up to make sure. Okay. And then we have seen nothing from Linda Manor at this point. We've seen nothing from Linda Manor. That's correct. And at what point do we expect to see money from that? So Linda Manor is confusing because we have traffic mitigation, traffic calming. Yeah. And tra traffic calming, as far as I know, requires this application. And so we have, when we mix the two, the two words, especially in our, our orders, traffic calming and mitigation, it gets, All right. and it's confusing for constituents also. Let me, one way that may help for constituents at least is to think about, um, that the basic rules, the basic state rules for this is we c it's not a developer's responsibility to mitigate existing conditions. So if we have a road that's broken already, that's the city's responsibility to fix. Um, it is the developer's responsibility to make sure things don't get any worse. So we have traffic common requests all over the city, and if we had unlimited money, we'd honor them all. Um, only those traffic calming requests that are directly related to the traffic from a new project are going to come under this program. Um, for Linda Manor, a portion of what they would do up front is sidewalks on the other side of the street from Linda Manor to connect the sidewalks that began for that small condo project. Um, and a portion they pay in cash. And I don't know the fa and again, the permit would have a phasing. I couldn't tell you offhand exactly when it is. But I assume it's when they get a building permit for some number of units. That, that's incidentally. Obviously, that's a lumpier project. Whenever they build Linda Manor, they're not going to build five units. They build the entire yeah. nursing home expansion. Um, but they were doing both the nursing home expansion there and assisted and live residence. So it's possible it was phased as two projects, but I just don't remember. So when they break ground? When they break ground, for both buildings, they absolutely pay. I don't remember if they're paying, you know, because they're doing two different projects yeah. there. I don't remember the phasing between the two. One's an expansion of the facility, the other one is, a, is a assisted living, too. That's correct. Okay. Right. Thank you. So we're, st we're still on the amendment offered by Councilor Freeman Daniels. Um, is there any further discussion about the amendment? Okay. Hearing none, I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor of adopting the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we're back to the main motion, um, the main order as amended. Is there any comment on that? Okay. Well, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Well, I just want to say that um, I think that uh, this is it's a good first step you know we're we're coming in line with uh, state law and and uh, I think uh, I, I I know that the Transportation Parking Commission has um, broadly speaking approved all these expenditures but I, I do hope that uh, we'll see a further uh, element of good process in which the Transportation Park Commission makes recommendations to the council uh, about these about the expenditure of these traffic mitigation funds in fact that's uh, part of a of a um, bit of ordinance that I introduced that's that we'll be having a hearing on later this month. Thank you. Okay, so that completes um oh, we have to vote. So I'll like oh, to sorry. call the question. You're all set. Well, I'm yeah. Any other any other uh, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is adopted on second reading. Okay, the next item is. Skip this case, probably. Okay. Yes. 
This is Whereas the Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Plan 2011-2017 uh, recommends expanding the Connecticut River Greenway to preserve the wildlife corridor along into the Connecticut River. And whereas the city owns 6.5 acres of land located behind 21 Hatfield Road and abutting and nearby to the northerly sections of the city-owned Connecticut River Greenway, said land consists of assessor's map 13051 and a sliver of property extending up to Hatfield Road. And whereas said land has a very low market value but has the potential to preserve a rich wetland and bird habitat, now therefore be it ordered that city council authorizes the mayor to execute a deed transferring the care and custody of the above referenced land to the Conservation Commission and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Section 8C of Chapter 40 of the General Laws, the Community Preservation Act, and Article 97 of the amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution, any fee, easement, or conservation restriction as defined in Section 31 of Chapter 184 of the General Laws or any other interest in the above land, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired. Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Again, this is on second reading. Um, is there any further questions about this? Okay. Hearing none, um, uh, and again, I, I did, failed to mention at the beginning, this is upon the recommendation of the Conservation Commission and Councilor Maureen Carney. Um, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on this um, because we are doing a land transfer. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Maureen Carney? Yes. Councilor Maureen Carney? Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so that is adopted on second reading. The next item is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development, uh, ordered that whereas the Massachusetts Highway Department agreed to fund the creation of a park and ride lot at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Leeds, along with a pedestrian phase for the VA Route 9 traffic signal, and whereas the Municipal Transportation Plan adopted by the Transportation and Parking Commission, the Planning Board, the Board of Public Works, and City Council recommends, quote, explore the potential for park and ride lots, e.g. in Leeds, unquote, and whereas on September 6, 2007, City Council authorized the Mayor to accept a long-term lease for a park and ride lot at the VA Medical Center, and whereas an easement may be a beneficial approach for the city and the VA Medical Center, now therefore be it resolved, the City Council authorizes the mayor to accept an easement for a park and ride lot at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Leeds. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Mr. Fiden, you've been recognized. Do you wish to just... Sure. Just, just very briefly, um, fairly straightforward park and ride lot here would really serve three different clientele, if you would. One is there is an existing PVTA bus that goes through there, so people can drive down from particularly Leeds and Hill Towns, park there, and they get on the bus. Um, the second is obviously particularly for people commuting to UMass or Springfield or anywhere else for that matter. People will drive down and get in somebody else's car and carpool somewhere else and hopefully not drive through downtown or, or in Bridge Road. And third, um, part of this project would include an on-ramp onto the existing rail trail that goes through Look Park's property. So people on the evenings or weekends or any other time for that matter can come and park in the park and ride lot and then bicycle or walk and get on, on the bike path from that point. Um, and then, I'm sorry, but I date myself. Um, I'd love to have a friendly amendment from somebody. Mass Highway Department became Mass Department of Transportation about three years ago, and I spaced out when I wrote this. <laughs> Oh, so someone could amend it to change it to mass DOT. So okay. I'll say all those in favor of amending that language say aye. 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 Okay. So it's now mass dot. Um, Councillor, this is being built by mass dot. That's correct. We'll go to bid. So, but yes. So why? Do you why does the city need an easement for this? So the issue is, um, if the land's owned by the federal government. MassDOT wants to make sure it will be guaranteed as a park and ride lot for at least 75 years. So they wouldn't build it on just federal government property and then potentially have the land be transferred. So they wanted either a long-term lease or long-term easement. We originally thought it would have to be a lease, which meant we would maintain the park and ride lot. 
and then negotiations with the VA, they said they're willing to maintain it, which is great from our standpoint. So the public will have the right to use it, but we won't have an obligation to maintain it. The, the one, just so you all know, so we're not hiding anything, the one responsibility that will be gaining is the traffic signal right there on Route 9 is currently owned by the VA. That will be transferred to the city. So that's what the VA gets out of this deal. But that signal will be upgraded. So new power supply, um, it will have a pedestrian cycle, so it, and it, it, it will have a controller that lets us connect to, you know, to let fire trucks and PVTA buses through. There's nobody from the VA here. Councilor? I, I, uh, I don't really see any major downside to uh, accepting an easement of uh, some other larger government's land and, uh, and yeah, assuming some responsibility over, uh, over the traffic signal, I guess, is a slight downside. But I think the advantage is having a park and ride lot and uh, not having to pay for its construction is far outweighs the, uh, the fact of having to upgrade a traffic signal or having to maintain a traffic signal. So I'm prepared to vote in the affirmative. Councilor? My only question would be, do you, do you think people will come down from the hill town and park there and take the bus into Northampton? I, I think it's the reason the three uses were, I guess one reason we like this site a lot is we're always nervous about creating empty parking lots. This is an area which the VA already was using, so they're going to get to keep some of these spots. I think you're going to get a few people take a bus. I think you get far more people who use it for park and ride, who get in somebody else's car. So two people coming from the hill towns might meet there and then drive to UMass. UMass in particular. One of the reasons UMass works so well and attracts park and ride users is because they charge a lot for parking. So you could park in Leeds for free and get in somebody else's car and then drive to UMass and save hundred to two hundred dollars a year in a parking yeah. fee. So I think that's where the use would be more. Um, I, I'm in favor. I'm in, I'm in the bulk of it. I hope it works out well. I'm pretty familiar with the parking lot. I've never checked it out. Um, I hope it works out great. Councilor LaBarge. I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm going to support this a hundred percent. I think I think we went through the same thing with Sheldon Field. People were leery about that. And look at it's become successful. There's no question about it. I have people in my ward who park their car there and take the bus. So I think this has opened the doors, and I think we'll be able to see how it's doing. Any other questions about this? This is in first reading. We have something in writing from the VA on this? Uh, I don't know that we have anything in writing. I have talked to the director about this project, and they are supportive of it. I've, yeah. when I was up there on a tour with him, we did discuss it, and they are they are supportive of it. Um, so I, I do feel like we're you know, and again we'll be executing legal documents with them, so they'll certainly be well aware of this um, in accepting an easement from us. So, okay, yeah. All right. And uh, can we see that language uh, at some point? Uh, on the VA? Cer I'm just curious. Certainly. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Do we have any? Will we be signing a contract with them, or we'll be signing the easement directly? We can certainly distribute it. I mean, again, this will be the mayor's the one who approves it, but we can certainly send the language to you. It will yeah. be a public okay. document. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So on first reading, all those in favor of uh, accept of authorizing me to accept this easement, say aye. 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 Oppose. Any abstentions? Okay. I just want to, I guess I want to clarify, um, before we go on to the agenda, there is a, there was a second amendment circulated. Tourism gift account. On the tourism gift account, the only difficulty that in, in the clerk is researching what took place at the last meeting, and we actually adopted that rules were suspended. On two we adopt, we, um, we excised certain language, and, and it was adopted on second reading and enrolled and and so there's not a there's not a second reading to amend it on so that's fine so i'll introduce it a new business I, okay or there's no hurry if you just want to wait or we can do it in a normal file if you're yeah i don't know I, I it could um i suppose it could probably int be introduced that way since uh well it's it's not on the agenda is that's all fine. i'm saying so i think we may want to put it on the agenda yeah. um, so whatever, we can figure it out as we go. Um, okay. Uh, 
so this is uh, this is an order. This is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development. Ordered that, uh, whereas as part of the redevelopment of the Northampton State Hospital, a portion of the stormwater from the L3 Communications Corporation drains into a city-owned parcel at 91 Grove Street, and whereas as a condition of a DPW stormwater permit, this drainage area needs to be maintained, whereas a drainage easement with the key clause, quote, the grantee accepts and covenants that they will have an affirmative obligation to maintain the berm and drainage swale channel to prevent erosion and degradation and prevent water from flooding the area southerly of the berm will, re quote, will reduce city liability. And whereas there is essentially no value to this land, which is adjacent to a wetlands and cannot be used for any other purpose, now therefore be it ordered that city council declares the rights in said drainage easement surplus to the city and that the City Council further authorizes the Mayor to execute an easement for said land on the terms outlined herein. Move to approve. Second. Second. Mr. Fyden, would you like to um, give us an overview on this one? Yeah, just very quickly. So for years and years, well before I was born, the, the drainage came down from what's now called Morgan, half towards Earl Street and half to Grove Street. And so it came across what's now our homeless shelter site. Um, when Cole Morgan was developed, they channelized that, so there's not more water, but it definitely comes through with more volume. We asked them to put a berm up so it wasn't creating flooding to our pro property, and then asked them to accept responsibility for that. And so, in return for them channelizing the water in that direction, they're happy to take full responsibility for the site. So this just allows them to come onto this property to maintain the berm and, and, exactly. and maintain this water system that they've created. Right. And gives them an affirmative covenant. So not only can they, but they have to, to maintain it. But, okay. So this. Councilor. So the city owns the property. That's correct. And L3 is going to maintain it. That's correct. That's perfect. <laughs> Just to maintain this very small section of it. Basically, it's a burn. The drainage. The drainage. Responsible for the maintenance of that drainage. Okay. There's a detention pond on their side of the line. That detention pond outlets on their property just off our property. Yeah. It flows across our property for roughly 50 feet yeah. until it hits a wetland. It's that 50 feet or it could be 80 feet where we want to make sure that they maintain that berm so it doesn't run down to our parking lot and create icing problems and drainage problems. And gets into the stormwater mm -hmm. fee here. Um, okay, so far so good. Thank you. Councilor LaBarge. Right, and I know, Wayne, that this has been brought up every time we bring in Peg Keller or somebody from Central Service about the Grove Street Inn, and that has been a problem. So I don't have a problem with this, but they want to go ahead and take care of it. That's all it's a problem. Okay. Any other questions or comments about this one? This uh, comes to you on first reading this evening. Okay. All those in favor on first reading, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next item before you, this is on the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. This is ordered that the City of Northampton elects to engage in the process to change health insurance benefits under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, Section 21 to 23. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So um, this was approved on first reading, um, and now it comes back to you on second reading. Like I can give you one update as to actions I took between, since your last meeting. Um, I did, in fact, uh, reach out and schedule, in addition to doing the required notifications that we did, um, not only by certified mail, we also did hand-delivered notifications um, as well. But I also scheduled an informational meeting with all the presidents of the city um, uh, collective bargaining units um, and had a and essentially did the same presentation that I did with, with the city council at our last meeting. Um, and we had a discussion about um, my reasons for wanting to adopt this process uh, moving forward um, and you know, had a very good discussion. Um, and obviously, uh, they knew that uh, the next step for this would be for this council to take 
the, the final vote on it. So I did, um, I did take your advice, particularly Councillor Carney, and I thank you for that, and have reached out to them and, and had a good opportunity to, to discuss it with them. Councillor. Um, if it hasn't been done already, if you could introduce the letter that we received today from the President uh, from the Firefighters Union, uh, Michael Hatch. Got a, sent us a letter today, and I think it's it might be in the, might be on our desk, and I don't know, okay. but, but just yes. to have it introduced into the record. Certainly, um, I can. I'll make sure that we. Uh, this is a letter dated October fourth, two thousand and twelve, um, and we will add it to the record of the uh, of the proceedings. Yeah, but there's concerns and, here. Yeah, and and actually, and yeah, to that point, I mean, could you address some of the the concerns that he raises? Actually, I. I um, uh, particularly he the ones that he itemized and I'll just read the ones he itemized. Okay. So, uh, if the intent is just to quote explore close quote other options why move through a formal process to adopt the law Two, accepting this law would nullify concessions already made by employees from all bargaining units including wage concessions and plan design changes in order to maintain our health current insurance options um, sick <laughs> by the way uh, this this uh, could further strain labor management relations and three the cost the, the deductible plans offered by the GIC would shift more costs from the health care provider to the employees and this shift in cost could limit access to care or necessitate tough choices between basic needs and proper care now I know actually point of fact you you did address at least two of these issues in initially when you were introducing this. I mean, but if you I'm could, happy to, I'm if happy you could to touch on them again, I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. In terms of the intent to explore, I think um, I think what I what I tried to indicate during the um, during the meeting is that this allows us the opportunity to enter into a process uh, that does involve doing this uh, doing this analysis that we would need to do as part of that formal process. Um, it, it would, but, it, but in it, terms of, but I, but I, but my intent is, I believe we we will need to try to uh, make changes to our plan, um, and this is the mechanism for for doing that. We, but, yeah, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, to to President Hatch's point, what he seems to suggest that that is not precluded um, by accepting this. If we accept, he he's suggesting, if I read it correctly, that you're able to research all of the options. Regardless of whether we grant approval or not, so what do you mean to suggest? Uh, I yeah. think that's correct. Except, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, we research the options now. We do that now as part of our right. normal process. Um, every year, we try to research what the various options are. I think what I have talked about is this particular. The state has created this process so that um, when you do when you do do that research, you then have a clear certain process with a clear time parameter around it so that you can make decisions. And again, make those decisions in the context of a process where I have, the city has to be able to offer, make a decision and offer health care uh, by May 1st for open enrollment. Um, that decision is then is is predicated on the larger budget number that we have to have. So, for example, next year, um, I'll have to present a budget to you um, in in May. I will have already had to have made a decision about the health care piece and build a budget based around that uh, to submit to you for June. Um, all of these decisions, this this process allows us to do that in a way where there is a negotiation. It's an intensified negotiation, but I'm allowed to then make have a clear a clear like time parameters around that. We have the negotiation, and then we're allowed to move forward with a plan design if we meet certain criteria. Or the same goes for the GIC. If we meet a certain criteria, we're allowed to move forward with that. So if I if I understand what you're saying correctly, that you you're you're seeking more clarity in the process and allow to expedite the process which might be held up uh, through negotiations or might be uh, might constrain you in a number of ways in order to um, make your budget decision in a timely fashion the state the state mechanism facilitates that process for you and and I think on, on the other hand that's that's the concern I'm seeing expressed here is that I, I think the language is in this suggesting um, the consequences are a little more dire than mm -hmm. than they are but essentially when we get to the crux of the issue is that you would like a more concentrated intensive process in order to work out your your budget in in a timely fashion 
and, and have some surety. And the bargaining units are concerned that they're sacrificing um, uh, leverage points and right. negotiation points. And, and is, do I have the sense of the rub? Uh, I, 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 you know, the, the larger that, that is, that is one of the issues that, that has been raised. And, and again, this is, uh, that is the nature, that is somewhat the nature of this law. It does shift the way that health care is negotiated at the municipal level. And that was the intent of the law. And the concern was with rising health care costs in the Commonwealth, um, with cities and towns really wanting to be able to retain employees with, with uh, flat budgets, with level funding, with you know, all those kinds of things, that having a, a, a sure and easier mechanism to be able to control health care costs was a, was a priority. Um, and so that's what the state has given us, this ability. And if we accept it, we're allowed to do it. And, 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 I, and in that context, the, the conversation, and this was discussed last time, but that, that this is, while this is being defined as a union busting kind of action, point in fact, there is a rather elaborate uh, um, uh, participatory process that uh, requires buy-in from the bargaining units. It just forces a quicker timeline, but the fact is that, that there, this is not ceding over total power to management to make the decision. The fact, that, but it does it does strengthen their hand. It does give it does give uh, it does give the city more leverage in that negotiation. That is, I will concede that point. But that's the that's the that's the that was the public policy imperative in terms of controlling health care costs. I think it would be helpful if I could go on to number two. I'll answer yeah. the questions. But um, so, for example, it says accepting this law would nullify concessions already made by employees from bargaining units, including wage concessions and plan design changes um, in order to maintain our current health. This could strain labor management relations. Now, um, this was a this was a this statement was particularly interesting coming from Local 108 because mm -hmm. they, in fact, re rejected the plan design changes that all the other unions agreed to. Um, during the pr during two processes ago, under the old system, so we we went through the old system. We went to the IAC. We met with uh, the team um, from all the various unions. We put forward a proposal for plan design change. That group can vote to recommend, which I think they did. They recommended that we make the change, but that's not a binding vote. It's only it holds no authority. They still have to go back to each of their individual bargaining units, take votes come back, I can still move forward with the plan, provided I um, bargain the impact. Uh, the outcome of what happened in that is we now actually have two sort of two sets of health plans. All the other um, bargaining units have the current health plan that we're under right now, Health New England, Local 108, because they refused to accept the plan design changes, um, are, are actually we're paying a higher premium plan for them, and their members are actually paying higher premiums um, for the plan because they would not accept those uh, changes. So that's an example, I think, of the way the other the the, the current process I think um, could get bogged down. This when we were in the PEC process, uh, that that author that group, which is has a proportional representation of all employees, actually has the power to negotiate on behalf of all the other employees. Um, and so I, I think that that number two is instructive in terms of uh, in terms of the difference in the process and in terms of cost um, again the GICP it was interesting at the meeting that I had a couple of the members including a firefighter said that they had colleagues in other communities who were on GIC plans and they actually paid lower premiums than Northampton firefighters mm -hmm. did so it's uh, so but but they uh, but the GIC, again, this is not making a decision to move into the GIC. It just gives us a, it gives a process whereby we can do it. We can actually move into the G, under the current law right now that was adopted in 2007, we can do it if we have the consent of 70% of the employees of the city. Um, uh, this new law uh, does, uh, allows us to have a, a slightly different process for doing that, but it requires strict benchmarking about the savings, and it also has mitigation. We have to share a portion of those savings with the employees. So it's a different process, um, uh, but again, it's a lawful process. It's what's been approved by the legislature. So adopting this and going through the process does not violate any any laws or anything. This has essentially been created as a lawful process within the Commonwealth. Uh, so I, I saw in Councillor Carney and then the next two councillors and then over here. 
Councilor. Okay, Pine. thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for actually uh, reaching out to the um, local union uh, leadership. It's so important, uh, especially in this case, it's such a sensitive issue. Um, yeah, uh, maybe for folks at home too, this, this came out of the municipal health care reform was very contentious last year, uh, summer of 2011, you know, down in uh, Beacon Hill and um, very stormy debates regarding this, uh, was uh, finally touted as the compromise bill and um, and many things did come out of that that as the mayor described does still remain in the arena of bargaining however it is no longer traditional bargaining mm -hmm. and you know uh, this was also touted as a necessary tool for cities and towns um, who would be completely uh, um, strong by needing to bargain collect with their unions over the uh, plan design. And I guess what concerns me here is that I'm just not fully convinced that it's something that's, that we need in Northampton right now. I'm just not convinced that uh, we need to move in this direction. I do think that um, traditional bargaining, well, as the mayor mentioned, we have a two-tiered system now with Local 108 having a different premiums than everybody else in the city. You know, it was an agreement. We do have a, a final agreement that was arrived at through traditional bargaining. And um, again, I'll just say that my objections are that I'm not convinced at this point that it's it's a law that we need to adopt here in the city. I completely understand and respect the mayor's uh, um, intentions here as those coming from trying to really uh, look at the bottom line and see what best ways we can save money, but I think that that can still happen um, within the parameters of the traditional bargaining, sitting down with each of the leaders. It may not be the GIC in the end, it may be some other plans, it may, you know, the, but ultimately uh, what we do when we adopt this is we do diminish the collective bargaining rights of our city employees, and I'm very uncomfortable with that at this point. And so I, I'll remain with my objections respectfully. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Freeman Daniels. I have a financial interest in this matter and uh, would ordinarily be have to disqualify myself from, uh, from even discussing this without disclosing it. So uh, I think I, I have to uh, disqualify myself except for the fact that by my knowledge, this would eliminate, if, if ever all the other counselors did as well who had financial conflicts, this would disqualify us for a, a quorum. So I'm going to invoke the rule of necessity. I, I just, I want to point out to you that the ethics commission ruling we had said that we only, it, it, this only has to happen once. You can do it again, it's fine, but we. It, so let me just okay. expound a little bit further. Um, I, uh, I have to have health insurance. Uh, it's, it's the law of the state. So uh, I have to get it from um, my employer who uh, does not offer it. Uh, and um, I don't know, uh, I'm willing to say it on, on public TV, you know, I'm, I'm very wealthy, I'm a very wealthy individual. Um, I'm actually probably the wealthiest individual in Northampton. Um, <laughs> I, other than perhaps uh, <laughs> Councilor Dwight, because I, I actually, I, I have more Facebook friends than, than he does. Uh, so, uh, or actually you have more than I do I have probably. Way more. So, um, my my wealth is 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 vast, and uh, to me the uh, the issue of counselors having health insurance is uh, mostly uh, a, a fact that we don't have uh, single payer health insurance in this country or or uh, universal coverage in the state. So you have to have it from an employer. Uh, my employer doesn't offer it. Um, so this is a fringe benefit offered through the city. So I'm I'm taking advantage of it. Uh, I might also point out that. Um, even if you factor in the benefits that the city gives me, uh, it's actually much less than the um, figure of $5,000 that was adopted for the council in 1986, adjusted for inflation. Uh, I, I'm actually getting paid less than the councilors were in 1986 after you adjust for inflation. And uh, so I, I'm not ashamed of myself for taking the city's health insurance and uh, I actually, uh, applaud the city for uh, uh, for offering pe people of, of my enormous wealth uh, 
a chance to uh, have health insurance. Thank you. Councillor uh, Councillor uh, Schwartz, and then Councillor Labarge, then Councillor Adams. Um, so I want to say, um, at the last meeting, I um, spoke in very strong support of this, and. I almost want to apologize because it was prior to my full comprehension, which happened at the, by the very end of the meeting, when I did realize, at the at the end of the day, what I do I do um, agree with Councillor Carney in needing to call out that it is um, it is a significant shift in the balance of power between labor and management, and at the end of the day, while Councillor Dwight, you were talking about there's there is bargaining and. You know, at the end of the day, it is the decision making is a unilateral. The power of the decision making is a unilateral one, um, with the constraints that Mayor Arkowitz outlined around the um, the 25 percent uh, has to benefit to the employers. There are constraints, but in the end, the decision making the the decision making is uh, is in the hands of management and. And and it was really the light bulb went on the end. Oh, oh, okay. This this you know we're not talking about a level playing field at all, um, and we are talking about the larger issue of I mean union busting doesn't that term doesn't work in this community thank goodness, um, but it it is it's on the edge of well it is it's a sh it's a shifting of of power, and um, and negotiating strength and so I'm deeply concerned about that and I'm and I'm. Really concerned because I do believe that it's part and parcel of this, um, of going, bringing us to the lowest common denominator to try to make ends meet, and that, and we are we are pushed to the wall with uh, this desperate, with where we're we're faced with this devil's choice uh, between, uh, you know, teachers in the school or uh, health insurance for the teachers. Um, and it's a wrong choice. And we need to reframe the debate fundamentally. And it is about where are our revenues coming from? How are we solving this fiscal crisis? And this isn't the appropriate route. And whether or not we, there are issues with the negotiating that are, that are outside of the fiscal constraints, let's, let's have at them. But this is a response fundamentally driven by our fiscal crisis. And it is, I think, a wrong solution. Um, in the perfect world. So, having said that, here we are in the imperfect world, um, filled with the here and now, filled with these terrible choices. And one, I have a very practical question that will help me sort this out, which is, can you restate, Mayor Narquist, who was, 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 was every union represented at the meeting that you had, that you held in between these two meetings? Uh, I invited everyone. Um, who, who which uh, unions? So, the um, president of, the, um, of NACE, the North, uh, Hampton government uh, employees. Nate? Did you say Nate? School employees. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, what is Sharon Carlson, who's the president of, of all of our education. Education. I'm sorry. I'm I'm blanking on the acronym. Six. Um, what's six. It? There's six. There's six different bargaining units that she represents. Um, um, Mr. Hatch, Michael Hatch, Firefighter Hatch, uh, who um, represents Local 108, and actually one of his board members also came. Um, the representative, the president of AFSME. Um, was there. The president of NAPIA was there. Um, is that the police? Uh, NAPIA's professional, professional employees. employees. Oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. So that would be uh, man mid level managers and some of the de department heads. Um, and then um, we had someone from Forbes Library who was there as well. Was police there? Uh, police did not did not send a representative. Uh, they did not send a representative, but they were all you know noticed, and we noticed. Uh, so I can't help but take note of this. I mean, I I do believe I I don't know I don't know what to how to interpret the um, we we got the communication from Mr. Hatch, and we haven't heard anything from others, and I don't want to assume. I don't know. I, I I don't know whether from this meeting, you know, there was this meeting, there was this conversation, there was a dialogue, and is the fact that we're not that they that we didn't hear from most of them, and that they didn't attend tonight. Although t attending tonight is is parenthetical because they might not have been able to make it, but they could have communicated other ways. And I'm not sure whether they're saying okay. Um, and I, mean, I, I will tell you, I was very clear with them that you know. I, this decision ultimately was in the city council, and that they should and could communicate with the city council and did, yeah. issues that they wanted to raise with you. So, uh, and again, they've received now th three different notices about it um, since the prior to my introducing it: um, certified mail, and in one case, hand delivered. So, which is part of the regulation. So, I, I, um, 
I've done what I can do yeah, to I try to be that. proactive. And, and the last thing I want to say, because I want to hear from other counselors, is that is that I, I totally respect and um, and really un understand, really could see it as your duty that you are bringing this forward to us, in that in that it is your charge to to um, use what is available to make sure we stay fiscally sound and maintain our basic services and our jobs. And I appreciate the position that you're in in doing this. And again, my objection is on a much larger level. Um, and, and if I do end up objecting, it's going to be on that larger level that this is not where the solutions lie. I am taking comfort wherever we end, if we do end up with this, that, that we have not had a hue and cry from labor and maybe because they trust our community too and, and they trust the processes that are laid out but i'm deeply concerned that this is where we have to get to so i'll stop here thank you very much councillor labarge i have to agree with councillor carney a hundred percent on what she's saying here mayor maybe you can explain why do we have to go through this process why do we actually have to go through this process of you being able to talk to a GIC? I, I just don't get it. You keep saying, yes, it's a general law and so forth. You just can't call GIC, make an appointment and have them come here. Why, why are we doing this? I'm not talking, it's, it's not about talking with the GIC. It's, it's more about a process. Um, uh, uh, the, the GIC is offered to all state employees. I understand that. You understand that. And, and so, and they've recently opened it up to municipalities, and now they've created this mechanism for going to the GIC or making plan design changes. And I, I, will, I will sort of echo what Councillor Schwartz said. I do believe it is my duty as the Chief Executive Officer of the city knowing the, the financial situation that we face on an annual basis, knowing the, the health care costs that we face particularly, um, I believe it's, it, it's my duty to bring this forward to the City Council for its adoption. Um, I, 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 again, it's, you know, I've, I've gone through, you know, we went through one budget process, we were facing a 12% increase. Um, we, I attempted to work through that process to try to find savings. Um, you know, we did have a plan that would have yielded significant savings, um, and um, it was ultimately uh, voted down um, by that, the, under the current system at least, the recommendation was that we shouldn't move to that system. Now, I could have moved to that system um, and then tried to do individual bargaining around it, but again, the time constraint that, I, that we're under, and as well as the financial constraint, it, uh, I think that's just as evidence of the system that we have right now, and I believe that this is an important tool for the municipalities to have to be able to mm -hmm. deal with health care costs. So I'm, I'm just concerned about the unions in general, mm -hmm. the total communication, how far are we with it? I've heard you say how you've had these meetings and so forth. Why would we be getting a letter from Mr. Hatch? I, should I'm, I called your office today, Mayor. And I did talk with Len in regards of the email that was sent to us from Mary Medora. And then I needed to get some verification on some of the language that Consular at Large Bill Dwight talked about today. I mean, tonight at our meeting. I also talked with Susan Wright. She had not seen this either. And it was very confusing here on some of this language. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had not heard back from anybody of giving me some of the verification of, of the language on here. Well, this was, yeah. if I can just respond to that, um, I, mean, I, I believe that I have, I have tried to have very good communications with all of our bargaining units when I, since I've come into office. I have um, settled all of our, well, I've settled most of our contracts with all of our units through this fiscal year. I've figured out a way, I believe, to give modest raises, to be able to give step increases as part of that process. I will say with Local 108, um, we haven't had a contract for several years. We don't have a contract and haven't had a contract for several years. We're involved in some, some um, uh, several multi issues on multiple fronts. We're in arbitration, we're in litigation, um, mediation, pickination, we're in every, you know, pick any, we're in, and, um, and, uh, and we are, so there's been some conflict with Local 108, and that, that has extended to the healthcare issue as well. So I don't really believe that that 
that, I don't think that's representative of, of the relationship that I've developed with all the bargaining units. And I do want to continue to work with them, and I do want to continue uh, to try to make sure that we can retain our employees and not lay them off. But I can tell you that if, if we come to next year um, and we're facing a 10% increase in health insurance and we're going to get level funded by the city, by the state again, you know, that's that's a million dollars I have to cut immediately from our budget. And as you all well know, most of that is employees. And so we'll have to lay off employees. So I believe this gives me the ability to make uh, reasonable changes in a, in as part of a negotiation, but it gives me the ability to do it in, with much more surety, clarity, and, and, you, and frankly using, you know, we get part of this, the impetus partly for this was state government was giving increasingly more and more of its state aid was going to health care costs at the municipal level. They've made changes at the state level. They have a, you know, state GIC plan that's allowed them to contain their health care costs. So part of it is they're actually wanting to see this at the municipal level as well. So, so also, that's, the, that's, that's one background. Also, too, I mean, you're talking about GIC. There are several policies through GIC. It's just not the state GIC. They have several others that you can get connected to. Plus, the fact is, this is where I need some language here. If this is approved tonight, this will give you the okay to go ahead and talk with GIC or whatever, okay? But they are going to have to prove to you as the mayor, okay, of what they're going to demonstrate percentage-wise, correct, with the health insurance? Yes. What, what, what the next step would be is we would have to develop a proposal um, to come to bring to the Insurance Advisory Committee, which is uh, the right. current standing right. committee. So we will um, uh, we, we, we work with a health care consulting firm. We actually just made a change in our health care consulting firm. Uh, we had been using a firm for many years. I decided to go out to bid for those services, and we've just retained a new firm. So that firm will be tasked with um, uh, doing, the, uh, doing the analysis like we do every year um, uh, and looking at GIC, looking at all the various plans that are out there. We can only use plans that are approved by the state, including yeah. the state plans. That's right. And, so, and then we have to develop a proposal. Now, this new system uh, also says we not only have to develop a proposal, but we have to show what the savings might be. We have to show um, how we would uh, share up to 25% of those savings with employees. So what that sometimes plays out in other communities. Um, sometimes they set up health care savings accounts for employees with those savings. Sometimes they do a holiday on premiums. They, you know, one month there's no premium as a way to pass the savings. So we'd have to develop all of that and bring it to this meeting. Um, and then that would begin this process. So okay, that's, what, that's the way the process works. Thank you for explaining that. The Actually, what bothered me with this letter is when um, the president of the union came out to state that Mayor Narkowitz has stated that adopting the Mass General Law 32B is just the first step in achieving cost-effective health care. This is where we disagree. And you've had a meeting with them, you just told us, so they're still disagreeing. Once this law is adopted locally, moving to the GIC is almost certain. It, it really isn't. It, it really, it's not automatic and it's not, and again, I, I don't, I, that's not, my intent in this is not to move into the GIC, but I'm certainly going to look at it. Right. And, if, and if we find, I mean, I talked about before the strict deadline. So if, it, to go into the GIC for July 1st of next year, I have, we have to notify them by December 1st of that's this right. year. So it's a very tight deadline. So I, I have, as I've said before, you're, you are just voting the first step in the process. You're not voting on whether to go into GIC or not, or whether to change no, plans. No, to give you the authority. It, it to gives go. us the it gives us the ability to then work through that whole process. And I gave you that flow chart right. from MMA, I which kind of shows you that. So thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilor Adams. First, I want to, want to address the suggestion that the that the, the health insurance benefits that we get are somehow a secret. They're not new, and they're not a secret. Uh, Councilor, well, we've been counselors have been eligible have have been offered this opportunity since 1977, and uh, we've been getting a stipend of, as Councillor Freeman Daniel said, since of uh, five thousand since nineteen eighty six. And I remember a few days after I was um, sworn in 
January of 2010, um, I didn't know there were any benefits. And I didn't, and, and I didn't know that, this until Human Resources called me and asked me to come in so they can tell me about benefits. And I sat down with Joanne LeGrant, and I know they reached reach out to other counselors too because I was there with Counselor Tacey. So Counselor Tacey and I sat down with Joanne LeGrant, and Joanne LeGrant went over Counselor Tacey and I, uh, all the benefits. She told us all about the health benefits, so we certainly knew about them. It wasn't a secret to us. And um, I imagine, because they called me, they did the same thing to the other counselors. So I think they did a good, good, did a good job of reaching out, at least to me and Counselor Tacey, because we were there. And um, <laughs> He said you didn't, you and, didn't know you were And so further, I think, that, <clears throat> I think that given the fact that with the information Counselor Freeman Daniels gave us, I don't think it's unreasonable to take the $5,000 stipend, which I'm thankful to have, and also get health insurance benefits. I was an elected Forbes Library trustee uh, with no stipend and no benefits, and I was happy to do that, and I'm happy to serve here for the small stipend we get. But I don't think health insurance benefits are unreasonable on top of it. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the person who spoke and suggested that we were some of the wealthiest people in the city, I'm not sure how she knows that. I mean, I now know that Councilor Freeman is the wealthiest person in the city. But before that, I didn't know how wealthy or unwealthy any of my fellows here were. But um, I don't think we're much more wealthy getting $5,000 a year as a stipend. With respect to the underlying issue, <clears throat> I, I respect completely what the mayor's doing here. I respect uh, the honorable mayor's job performance in general. However, <clears throat> I have to agree with the well-articulated points of the learned counselor from Ward 1, and I have to agree with her in voting no. Thank you. Uh, point of order? Okay. Uh, uh, I just uh, want us to be careful, Mayor, that we stick to the issue at hand, because I think the, the issue of whether members of the city council or the school committee or the elected officials, whether they derive health benefits is not germane to this particular issue as it's presented. And I just don't want us to confuse the matter or confuse the public. I, re I'm, I respect Councillor Adams' uh, reasoning and Councillor Freeman Daniels, but I would respectfully ask that we stick to the issue that is on the floor, mm -hmm. which is adopting the yes. state law okay. that is presented. So, so if I could just um, get back. Councillor Murphy had his hand up, then Councillor Spector, then Councillor Tacey, then Councillor Dwight. Or I may have got, it may actually be Murphy, uh, That's okay. Tacey. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Point of order, Robert's rule says if you spoke on it once, yeah. everybody, you don't speak oh, yeah. on it a second time until somebody else. Yeah. Councillor Murphy. Go ahead, mm -hmm. David. You know, it, it does appear that all the players in this little insurance drama are all victims of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and its infinite wisdom and the way it dealt with this issue. I mean, they recognized the fact that the managers of municipal government needed more flexibility in dealing with the expensive issue of health care. And then they came up with this cockamamie approach to do it, which I don't think makes me as an elected city councilor responsible to the taxpayers to efficiently run the city happy. It doesn't make the mayor happy. It doesn't make the unions happy. But it's the one tool the Commonwealth chose to give to us. And I don't see how we cannot exercise that tool. We didn't design it, but it's the only tool we have. I, I don't like it. The mayor doesn't like it. The unions don't like it but it's what they gave us. And if you look at any source of revenue we have, try explaining the property taxes to people. I did that for years. The Commonwealth set it up, we have to abide by it. The meals tax, the room, you know, the, ho the hotel tax, the meals tax. It's all crazy. We're not really an economically viable entity. I'm sure the Commonwealth knows that, and they use, they use state aid to keep us all in line. There's no one in this discussion that isn't a victim of the Commonwealth. But if any of you know how we can get the Commonwealth to change its behavior and respect its 351 municipalities as equal partners in government, from what I can tell, we deliver more direct services to the citizens of the Commonwealth than they do. God bless them. I just wish they'd get helpful. I just wish they'd respect us as an equal partner in government and let us deal honorably in some of these things rather than with these bizarre solutions they send to us that might be a politically expedient for themselves, but it certainly doesn't work for us at the local level. Uh, I'm prepared to support the mayor in responsibly using the one tool he's been given. Do I like the tool? No, but we only got one tool and we got a big problem. They recognized the problem, but they didn't give us a very good solution. Yeah. So, Councillor Spector and then Councillor Tacey. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Tacey. I'm sorry, Councillor Tacey. Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> too many. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Councillor Tacey, then Councillor Spector. Uh, well, um, also, uh, having heard from the wealthiest man in the city and alluding to the second wealthiest, um, we will. Uh, I, it's all about saving money. We, we flirted with cresting $10 million worth of health insurance for years. It was close a couple of times, and once it went up above, and then all of a sudden didn't charge us, didn't go quite so much, so it went down below $10 million. Now it's above $10 million. So it's all about saving money. So it is all in the same. It is all in the same big picture here. We're trying to save some money somehow, and uh, it is the only tool. And I was, thank Councilor Murphy for saying it is the only tool that we have, or one of the only tools that we have to do to do this with. the The state says you have to have insurance, and your full time employer does not provide it. So, uh, but a part time employer does. But maybe we need to look at uh, how we even pass out our own health insurance maybe we should look at part-time employees uh, as though a regular uh, employer does not um, does not provide well, point of order mr. Right. chairman I, I, I've asked I think this is a, I think I'll I, say I, point of order oh okay Go ahead. I just, I just asked for a ruling on the point of order that I brought up earlier uh, well, certainly the issue of of individual employees receiving health insurance is really not germane to this particular issue that we're debating, which is the issue of do we accept my point of order mass general law. Uh, so, but I, I just wanted to. I'd like to say something. Point of order. Well, actually, yes. I, I want to give yes. Councillor Tacey an opportunity to yes. finish his statement yes. if he has other information that he wants to provide. I mean, we talk about, we're talking about desperate and fiscal crisis, fiscal well-being, mm -hmm. maintaining basic services and jobs. This is all part of this discussion, mm -hmm. it's all part of trying to do something to save money. And I was going to offer a proposal that maybe save the city some money and maybe save some of these jobs. Next year, our health insurance is going to go up again. It goes up every single year. So to put the discussion off and just brush it to the side, and every time we point try to order. discuss something. Mr. Chairman, point of order. This is not on. Here's, here's the point of order, and I want to speak. I think this is a very important issue. Therefore, members of the public. The reason we have an agenda is so that people know when an issue is coming forward. It's part of the whole um, way that we have a meeting. This is, I'm not trying to brush this under. I'm trying to say this should be something that, is ref that comes to the city council. It perhaps should be referred by a number of committees. It is not germane to this particular issue. I don't, I think we should, I'm not putting it off. I think it should go on the agenda as soon as possible. I think it's a broader issue. It needs to be on the agenda. It's a full discussion in itself, but it's not a discussion here. We could talk about 400 different ways of saving money. All of those should be discussed. Just because it's part of, of health care does not make it germane to this particular issue, and that's my point of order. I, I guess, I guess my, my regret is that two other counselors have, ex have expounded on this issue during this debate um, of counselors having health care. Okay. So I feel that it's can I make a suggestion on the, can I make, it's very germane. Can I make a suggestion as to procedure? Uh, go ahead. If there's a point of order, if I'm correct in Robert's rules, if, if it's requested, you make a ruling. The mayor makes the chair makes the no. ruling. Yeah. And and then it can be appealed to the full council who can vote yes or no on the yeah. mayor's ruling by majority rule. So okay. maybe we should do that. That's the process and that's democratic. So I guess yes. I'll, let me let me issue a final ruling. Uh, my ruling is I believe Councillor Tacey has the right to offer information in the debate that he feels is germane to this issue, mm -hmm. as other counselors have. I will say, though, that if it comes to the point of offering proposals on things that are, that, that are not really ad adaptable to this particular chapter of state law, that that, that that would be better suited to be brought up in a separate meeting, noticed, et cetera. But in uh, terms of, I, I believe, if, so that would be my ruling. If point, you want to make a comment. Point of information? Mm -hmm. Just to clear this up, on uh, Section 11 and the charter that we're about to vote on, uh, uh, Article 10, within 180 days after the passage of this act, the city council shall enact an ordinance establishing an elected official compensation advisory board. Said ordinance shall contain provisions that the board shall periodically, but no less frequently than 10 years, study the adequacy and equity of the compensation benefits and expense allowed 
allowances of municip municipal elected officials and report its findings and recommendations to the mayor and the city council and said report shall be filed with the city clerk and said ordinance shall further specify the composition term of office and method of appointment of the members of said board and any other provisions deemed appropriate by the city council this will be discussed when the charter is when if. or if the charter is passed this is actually conditional on the charter a review of the compensation the council has currently receiving and will receive in the future it will take it out of the political realm and put it in a public commission's oversight i think if i may that should put a rest to that portion of this discussion and go back to the discussion the more relevant and germane aspect of the discussion that we are getting lost to be honest and so, this, so. I, so i've ruled but, on the point of order that i i believe that Councillor tashi should be able to finish his statement uh, I do not believe it would be appropriate for him to make a, a proposal or, or talk about something that really hasn't been noticed, et cetera. But I believe he should he can finish his statement. That's my rule. Unless there's an unless and, just, oh, someone, so, can someone object can, to the rule counselor can appeal and then it goes to the full council for a vote on, on the totally chair's correct. decision. If, if, they, totally if you correct. if they wish to. under your rules, you are that is totally correct. So I make that's my ruling. Um, and it stands. Okay, so, uh, so Councillor, if you want to proceed. My point, my point is all about money. It's all about saving money, and whatever we can do to save money, if that is a tool that we have, that is what we will go with. And I do believe this is on the agenda. The insurance is on the agenda. Uh, but and not the topic. This is the topic of accepting a state right. law, Section 2123. Uh, I intend to support it. We're not talking about the, the other issue that you're talking about in terms of a specific proposal that can be debated and voted on tonight. I intend to support it. But I also don't think that anything should be stifled on, on the tension that maybe a vote may pass or may not, and maybe we will get this in. It never happens. I mean, everything is discussed long before votes are taken, and I wouldn't want to rest on the charter passing or failing. Okay. And maybe the discussion can happen at any time, even before the charter is even voted on. It, it, that is certainly can it just under our open meeting law we have to let the public know that we're going to have that discussion and give them proper notice the vote of the charter i don't think is even doesn't even play into this mm -hmm. okay. well, it absolutely does not play into it yes it does um it's right in there oh yeah he, he was, next. Yeah. Yeah. was next in line so bigger um on the on the issue we were talking about i just want to say i i actually agree with both councillor murphy simultaneously with Councillor Schwartz and the Councillor from Ward 1. Uh, and it's kind of what you were saying. I think everybody's right here. Uh, I think the, on a theoretical level, if it's just theory, I actually would vote against this tonight. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I'm going to vote yes, and I think part of the reason, my guess is, part of the reason why we don't see a lot more opposition from people coming forward is because of the specific mayor we have right now. And I've worked with him for a long time, and I think his fairness in dealing with all parties is pretty well known. What concerns me is I don't think he's going to be mayor forever. He will be, but I don't think he, I uh, I don't think he will be. And so the, the long term does concern me, because I think it is very much the problem with a law like this, when you put it in, when you give the administrators more power, then it's the individual administrators that can be good or bad. So one of the questions would be, well, if, if and when you decide not to be mayor or run anymore, how easy is it then we could come back and change this, ordinance. correct? So uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm in the middle on voting for this. I believe I will vote yes, um, especially given the uh, reasoning of Councillor Murphy. But uh, I, I do have qualms. Can, we move the can, can I put you in the unfair position in the absence of any representation speaking to the otherwise and the 11th hour letter from the president and the firefighters? What was your sense of the meeting? What did you did you get? A, were objections actually raised that you did not satisfy or? Uh, I, I think I mean, we had a uh, discussion mainly about the, the differences in the process. The, there was a discussion regarding the weighted vote in the PEC, um, uh, which is weighted to the number of employees. So um, Sharon uh, Carlson, who's right. the president of NACE, said that you know she would have a, a sort of a veto type vote on the committee just because she the sheer number. Of she represents employees. the largest bargaining um, units. Again, I, I, I mean, I, I would say that even under the current process, that 
that to exist because they're the largest block of employees. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so if we um, cannot reach uh, agreement on health care with, with them, then it's going to affect our costs. And it's going to, and so it's, uh, I really don't see that as a, as a major stumbling block. Plus we talked about that there you are, are other, those other employees are represented at the table. There's a give and take. And I said, you know, there's also an aspect of that. you will have to work together as a group it. to come up with what you believe is the best, um, outcome or the best plan option for the rest of the employees that you're elected to represent. Um, so that, that, that was one aspect of it. Again, I mentioned that several employees, um, uh, the Napia representative said that they were, they were, you know, they appreciated the, 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 um, interest in, in trying to do some analysis. And, you know, they, I think they had a spouse that work was in the GIC. So they'd had some experience with the GIC that was, so they had some experience in that. And I mentioned the other firefighter who had a colleague who was in the GIC. Um, and, and so there wasn't, there, there wasn't, um, you know, it was not a contentious meeting. It was really my giving, laying out my reasons. I think that there was, you know, discussion about the concerns about cost shifting and about um, uh, whether or not, um, you know, say, you know, this would affect compensation discussions and et cetera, those kinds of things. Um, but again, it was it was an informational meeting. Everyone was very respectful, and and um, you know, we that's that's how we. We left the meeting. Well, I, w- I would say, actually, it's, I think it's significant the absence of representation objecting. Um, I'm not going to assume assent on their part, but I'm certainly not going to. I, I can't presume that they're all sick or distracted in some other way and didn't see this coming for for some time. And particularly, you know, uh, uh, a president of any bargaining unit is going to be damn sure to make, as as uh, President Carlson was the last meeting, to be here ASAP and emphatically state their case at the time, which actually precipitated the conversation we're having now. Their absence tonight actually speaks louder in many respects to me. I'm per, I'm, I, mean, I, I think there's the, dil- the due diligence is being done and presented by the mayor given the, the lousy circumstances that we all agree. But the fact is, is that, that I, I'm going to presume in the absence of dissent, and actually, and I think President uh, Hatch's dissent um, was muddled, I'll say, and um, in not necessarily as cogent as I would think that it should be in order to to at least generate enough uh, objection for me. I think the because we bear a responsibility now. This is the one point, and this is of course my also added frustration. This is the one point that actually we as the elected representatives get to weigh in, yay or nay. This is it, and the fact that. That burden is on us. That the burden is consequently on the representative units to make their case known and make it known to us. And and certainly, you know, President Hatch's letter came, I think, uh, three hours ago or four hours ago, how long, however long it was. I I'm going to I'm really actually going to um, comfort myself in some small way by thinking that that it is this is not the line in the sand that they're prepared to draw as far as bargaining. Uh, leverage and I I don't want to I at the same time have, have can generally repulsed by any diminution of, of of collective bargaining strength and 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 strategy but at the same time recognizing that we have fiduciary responsibility as the elected officials for the people who are actually subsidizing this and in the absence of overt expression of objections in the presence of a, of a looming issue, as, as Council Schwartz laid out and as Council Murphy also laid out, to, to, to suggest that we defer our responsibility in that respect, I, I would feel that I would actually not be doing what I was elected to do. So I will actually be voting yes. I think as many councilors who will be voting yes with a, a bad taste in my mouth that is not reflecting the mayor's diligence. It is actually more to Council Murphy's point that we are daily asked to make really absurd decisions based on an absurd construct that gets more and more absurd all the time. And it's the frustration we speak of, and this is the larger issue that Councilor Schwartz is talking about, is what we speak of. It's not just, it's, it doesn't emanate from this town. It, eman- it, it comes from without. It comes from the state. It comes from the federal government. It comes from the choices that we make 
as a as a country uh, collectively, and we've we've bought into this really cynical plan and design that we keep being told we're giving tax cuts. When point in fact, actually, we're just finding other sneaky ways to subsidize these things. And then we're the ones on the ground who have to make the decision for the really stupid antic processes that we're left with. But the, the thing that's most critically important is the fact, as Council Tacey pointed out, these are mounting costs. And at the time that these, these insurance was originally given, it was actually given as, as, a, way, as a dodge for um, um, management or the CEO to couldn't come up with the money to provide salaries, so there was a cheaper way to provide insurance. The insurance was a bargain at that time, once upon a time. And that was, you know, we can give you insurance, we can't give you a pay raise, but we can give you insurance that will cover your health care costs further on down the line. Now, health care costs universally throughout the country actually inform every, almost every fight that we have and the most cynical fights that we're having as well, but they create the biggest financial crisis that we're dealing with. And this is where the rubber hits the road. I, I can't in good conscience uh, deny the mayor the opportunity to at least expedite the process. I think that actually the way the Commonwealth has structured it, there's so many bites of the apple here and so many opportunities and so many requirements, particularly the impact requirements that there was protections built into the system that I that I would hope and assume that some of the bargaining units recognize. So, uh, I, I, all said and done, yeah, I'll vote yes. Um, if I could just, uh, there was only one other. Th I forgot to mention one other thing that that did transpire at the meeting, and that was there was an agree there was there was agreement by I put it out there. They agreed that the the overall healthcare system is broken, and that we spend too much time in rooms like that. Well, hard to find a sentient bird, so, person who would argue exactly. about the so, opposite. So there, what we there was common total agreement on that. I think Councilor Freeman Daniels, and then Councilor Carney, and then Councilor Murphy. Uh, so there's not much new I can say. I also, I, like I said last time, if I were a member of a union or a union president, I certainly wouldn't feel very comfortable with this. Uh, and I do think that uh, we've heard from two significant unions, uh, union representation: uh, the president of the firefighters, the president of of the educational uh, union. So. Uh, I, I do think that uh, this is generally something that uh, hurts a union bargaining uh, right uh, ability, and um, I have to remind myself, number one, that uh, you know we I have an obligation uh, as as all the rest of the councilors do to the taxpayers of of Northampton and to the people um, that we provide services to, whether or not they pay taxes, uh, and also um, that. Uh, that health insurance costs have been spiraling out of control, and they're very they're very difficult to control. So this is the best this is the best tool that the state has given us so far, and we've seen the evidence from over a hundred other towns in Massachusetts. They've saved millions of dollars. And um, finally, that uh, the the last piece is there is um, it, it isn't as though uh, the the mayor will be able to go directly into the GIC uh, and so on, and and it really isn't as though the GICs really a bad thing because uh, the uh, GIC is what the state employees get. Uh, it's a level of care that the state feels comfortable providing its employees. So uh, it's a it's a decent level of of um, of insurance and uh, so I'm I'm comfortable voting aye. Councilor Murphy. You know, the one thing that would be guaranteed from this if we vote for it is the fact that we'll have a level playing field. When this process is done, all the members of the bargaining units and all the unrepresented people for that fact that get health care will be getting the same thing. It will create a level playing field and even environment. If that is accomplished, there's nothing that stops our 13 bargaining units from bargaining anything else they want to bargain to, in their opinion, level their playing field. They can go back and negotiate any of the other items that they want to negotiate with the city. The plan will be done. Everyone will have the same insurance. But if there's something important to the police or the firefighters or the teachers or the Napier people, they can negotiate anything else they want if they feel that that's a process that will, again, level the playing field for them. And those are things that this law does not, you know, give the mayor a process on. He's still got to negotiate anything they want to negotiate with him. So it might take health care and make it a, a level playing field for everybody and take plan design away from each bargaining unit. But it doesn't take away from them anything else they choose to bargain. And it might be one thing for one group and something for another group. So right. while, it, while, while this may, might make health care uh, 
more efficient for the mayor to handle. It's, it's really not going to affect the rest of bargaining branch, I assume. Am I correct in that? Uh, Being a, sure, you know, as, as our resident uh, expert, resident such expert. <laughs> um, and through the chair, I actually, uh, I found very interesting uh, Councillor Murphy's uh, argument about the level playing field. It, it looks like it. I mean, it's to say that we're taking we're taking this aspect, this uh, traditional bargaining over plan design, away from everybody, then levels the playing field. That that is an interesting uh, point. And so, um, however, I, I disagree that taking it away from everybody makes it somehow better. <laughs> but it is really interesting. Um, one thing I do want to say is I, you know, what makes us we brought a lot of personalities into into this argument, which is unfortunate because what, we're, what we do when we pass this law legislation is we're passing this for future administrations. I have every confidence that Mayor Narkowitz could sit down even in a traditional bargaining setting and work these things out and be able to, uh, as has been done in the past with previous mayors and as he's shown so far in being able to come to resolution on a number of collective bargaining agreements, um, come to terms and come to uh, uh, agreeable terms around wages, benefits, plan design, all of those things. I'm less confident because I, of an unknown, of a, of a future mayor and of future councils and of future local union presidents for that matter. So in, in some ways that's why I'm less comfortable with making Really, as Councillor Schwartz pointed out, it's much more about the fundamental shift in balance. We would all be hearing very loudly and clearly if this were in the reverse, if actually the legislation were such that from now on collective uh, uh, local unions, municipal unions may make the final decision on all matters of plan design. I think everybody, is, you know, that would really shake things up. But, you know, in fact, it's not that. It's that the mayor um, can make that decision. And right now, I'm just not sure that it's necessary. That's, that was my own thing. I haven't been convinced that we can't come to a resolution in our traditional forms of bargaining that we've had up to this point. And that was, you know, fundamentally my argument and my objection, respectfully, because I have utmost confidence that this mayor would be able to achieve those uh, agreements amicably. Councillor Schwartz. I just want to say that I respect my colleagues' um, dilemma and struggle and outcome um, and um, decision to support it. I, I do believe I, um, I think I object to the premise, Councillor Murphy, of um, it's the only tool, so we need to use it. I actually think that if it's a, if we think it's a failed tool, then um, I'm not convinced, therefore, we should use it. Although I understand why we might be. I mean, so again, I really respect the moment that we're in, and I really want to say that um, it is, it's, a, it's a reflection of, uh, of our times and of the battle that lies ahead and, of the, and where we need to put our energy. And I would really love to see joining forces across the community, across counselors to unions um, and, the, the, and all of the various constituencies to come together to make the changes in the Commonwealth that it's, I feel like you've given up on them, th th those changes being possible. And I want to say I haven't and we can't. And that the advocacy for real tax reform that gets us the revenues from people who can afford to pay, that where we're not then having to turn to this recourse. I, I do want to say that's where we need to put our energies in the future p following this vote uh, whatever its outcome, and I look forward to participating in that because um, I, I do feel like this is emblematic of, um, of going to the, like I said before, the lowest common denominator where we can, and I want to raise the level of debate and raise our definition of success and solving this problem. Uh, Councilor Barge and then Councilor Dwight. Uh, I'm going to support this because I feel that we are just authorizing you mayor to go ahead and be able to talk with whoever you have to talk with and I also believe you as a mayor will work with all the unions throughout the municipality without a problem so I don't I didn't see any unions here tonight and that bothers me except for this one letter so I think if there was such an outcry they would have been here standing in line speaking in front of that microphone. So 
and no matter if we get another mayor someday, we've had, I've had, this is my third one now, and I've seen changes, and we've never gone under as a city, never gone under financially as a city. So I think we're in good hands, and I think if the mayor should ever leave, it will follow. Thank you. Councillor Tacey. Can I move the question? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Some sorry. other folks didn't sorry. want to speak, oh. but if you want to... I didn't see any, uh, one more hand, and then... then. I, I actually... I, I, I do want to... I, I, the part of the frustration, and I, this is Councillor Carney's point about the personalities, and it's true. I mean, we, we, make, we make laws and rules that are not for personalities or for existing personalities. We make it for... We, we codify something that, that are tools to be used by whoever is officiating. The thing is, is that, you know, we're doing double duty tonight. Uh, Council Carney is speaking for the unions, and we're debating for the unions, and we're negotiating for the unions in the absence of union conversation and participation. Now, uh, um, the president of the teachers' union um, stated her objections at the time. I don't know if they were satisfied during the conversation with you subsequently. I have no way of knowing. Right. But I, we, I, I think their job, they have a job too, we, as just as we have a job. And that is to, to make the effort to express to us their concerns about this as a process. Um, uh, President Hatch did. <coughs> And I think to some degree, they, uh, I don't think his concerns have been satisfied, but I think they've been addressed in some level, at least to the point where I'll, I'll feel a little more comfortable in this. But the fact that, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that we actually have a council that will debate this. We'll debate this with uh, considerable passion and emotion invested in it and for the right reasons, and that is to protect the rights of workers which is we declare in proclamations that really have no standing for the most part over and over and over again. And this is where we actually have to where it manifest, where we actually have a point where we, we get to actually put that into effect. At the same time, I'm saying I'm voting yes. I, I appreciate the, uh, the dichotomy. But the fact is here that I, I think, I don't think it's asking too much. And I'm sus I suspect that I will hear from the union's PDQ after the fact on this vote, depending how it breaks. But I, th you know, a letter, um, a phone call, coming speaking for the public session. This is not a secret meeting. This is and and they have been apprised way in advance, even by statute. And I think all efforts to reach out to the bargaining units have been made not only in spirit, but have even gone beyond the spirit of the, of the law. And I think in in that situation. I feel it, it, it makes it a little easier for me to vote for this because um, we, to Councilor Freeman Daniels' point, it, it, we, there is a, ultimately, for me at this point, to vote no in this case would actually make me feel as if, in the absence of an objection, make me feel like I'm not making a responsible decision. Councilor Murphy, we're going to roll call this correctly. Yes. That's correct. Please. Uh, any other comments, Councillor Tacey? To move the question. Okay, great. Um, all those then in favor, I'll ask the clerk to call the rolls. All those in favor on second reading, say aye. Those aye. Ayes. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, respectfully. Councillor Dwight? Yes, respectfully. Councillor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councillor Lagarde? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Aye. Councilor Schwartz? No. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? No. Six, yes. Okay, so the measure is adopted uh, by a vote of six to three. Um, and uh, we'll now move on to the rest of the agenda. Six to three. Oops, sorry. I have to get this back to her. Um, and then this was. I don't know if it's your copy or, okay. Uh, Councilor, requested about? a break. What's that again? She requested a break. Oh, um, well, we have, we have one more item. Okay. One more. That's so, all right, Jesse. One more item. Okay. You can make it. I was hearing talk of a break, but I believe we have one more item on the agenda. Um, so the next order then is, um, have to get back to this. This is the, upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development, 
ordered that whereas the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan adopted by the City Council and Planning Board uh, sets goal H2, preserve and sustain existing affordable housing, and an objective under that goal, identify the present affordable housing at risk, e.g. expiring use and rentals that might be converted to condominiums, and work with property owners and others to identify and secure funding sources to preserve the units as affordable. Whereas the new South Street apartments, formerly known as the Heathy Block, 22 to 34 New South Street, contain 18 dwellings with an affordability restriction covering most of the units expire on December 31st, 2028. And whereas as part of an agreement with the city and using CDBG funds, but no other city funds, the property owner has agreed to grant a new affordability restriction to the city, extending affordability for 25 years to December 31st, 2053. Now therefore be it ordered that city council authorizes the mayor to accept and execute an affordable housing restriction, extending affordability. Is is there a second? Second. second. Uh, this is coming to you on second reading. Is there any discussion? Councilor. I just want to say I, I support this completely. Um, I lament that there's not more affordable housing in the city. And I know that the last numbers I got, we're doing reasonably well, at least with respect to what the state requires. So I know that we're, I don't think we're necessarily behind, but I wish that that, that number were higher. I wish that we had more affordable housing. I wish that, I wish there was more. And um, particularly in the downtown area. So... Um, being that I think affordable housing is extremely important, especially with respect to the downtown area, I think this is absolutely the right thing to do. I support 100%. Any other counselors wish to speak on this? Okay. Um, all those in favor then say aye. 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 Opposed? Any ex abstentions? Okay. Um, so that is adopted on second reading. Um, that completes, oh, sorry about that, we have, that completes the orders. We now have an ordinance for referral to the Committee on Elections Rules, Ordinances, Orders, and Claims. Uh, this is a transportation uh, parking area for municipal officials, amend section 312-33. Um, is there a motion to refer this to the ordinance? Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor of referring say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, updates from the council president and committee chairs. Um, well, we know about the parades and things like that, so that's good. I, the, I don't have to do that. Um, there will uh, currently there, there will be a forum that NCTV will sponsor for discussion of uh, the issues surrounding the charter ballot question. Uh, if folks are interested in attending, we'll, we're setting it up in process, and that it will be an open forum and uh, to discuss what the charter is, why it's an important voting issue, and why Paul and DiMaz has to print up 20,000 ballots separate uh, for the community to participate in their own democracy. So I will keep you apprised of that. As, a, as I find a date, you will all know when I know. And that's it. Um, any other um, updates from committee chairs? OK. Any new business? OK. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The, the meeting is adjourned.